minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. Welcome back, everybody. We have episode seven of Kush's Corner here on the Trap Talk Reptile Network, the coolest reptile network in the world. Before we get to the show, as always, US Arc. For anyone who is not aware, US Arc is the organization that is fighting for our rights to keep reptiles, run our reptile breeding businesses, and, and pursue this, this way of life. If you're not already a member, check out US Arc's website, see what they're all about. As a community, we have strength in numbers, so the more people we can have behind our common causes, the better. So check out US Arc. And tonight we are brought to you by Blake's Exotic Feeders. If you're in the market for uh, for frozen quail, check out Blake's Exotic Feeders. They hand raise everything so you know that the animals are being cared for properly and you know exactly where your source is coming from. So if you want some quail, check out Blake's Exotic Feeders. And we are also brought to you tonight by the Reptile Talks. So this is a symposium going down in Anaheim, California, May 17th through the 19th, uh, with many of the industry leaders, both from the uh, academic side and from the captive herpetoculture side, giving talks about the animals that they specialize in. So if you are either in the area or are willing to travel for a symposium, I would highly suggest checking out the Reptile Talks. And here we are, episode seven. And... Uh, as many of you have seen already, I hope you would know by now, we have on Ryan Young from Molecular Reptile, Python breeder extraordinaire, uh, another fellow scrub aficionado. And uh, we have lots of cool stuff to talk about tonight. We got some people who have shown up early. I appreciate you guys above all scales. What's going on? We got 1776 Exotics. Good to see you. Lucid Arboreal's in the house. We got John DCI Exotics. What's going on, man? Northwest Herptological. We got we got the boss of the network right here checking in. We got Brooke as well. Thanks for being here. But uh without any further ado, let's get Ryan on the show. How's it going, man? Pretty good. And yourself? I'm I'm doing just fine. Uh how are how are things in the, the great great up north? Oh, it's getting warmer, so that's good. <laughs> what what is what is warmer to you? Uh, this time of year, 50s at 50s at, during the day, and uh, it was below freezing last night. Ooh! So the turtles had a little ice over their pond this morning. So, yeah, yeah, that uh, sounds about right. Uh, what kind of turtles you got up there? Um, the ones that are outside right now are the spotted turtles and some Japanese okay. pond turtles. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I I love spotted turtles. I was fortunate enough to work with some in the past. They're just they're them and the North American wood turtles. I'd say are my my favorite North American turtles. They're yeah, just, I haven't kept any wood turtles yet. I'd like to, but yeah, they, they, a lot of personality, a lot of personality to those turtles, and uh, it's hard to beat that that orange skin coloration. That, that to me is is just so cool. Yeah, yeah. Some of the spotted I have are real orange legs. Yeah, how many do you have? You have a, like a group of them? Uh, yeah, I got like twenty or something. I don't know. Oh wow, <laughs> that's 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 a colony, all right. A <laughs> do do they like lay eggs in the banks and do they do they hatch out in there and stuff like that or? Uh, they're just in waterland tubs. Oh okay. And then uh, I I did hatch some last year. Oh wow, that's awesome. Yeah, definitely a a bit so of. A... Was, uh, that was my first spotted turtle babies last year, so that was pretty fun. That's awesome, man. Bring back the youthful enthusiasm. Yep. Yeah, you you gotta you gotta do that, man. How's the how's the breeding season going so far? What's what are some of the um, it seems a little slow. Uh, usually I have more stuff that is ovulated by now, so I don't know. We had a pretty mild winter overall. I don't know if that hurt me, helped me, or or it's just a weird year. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people have been saying that everything's been been kind of pushed back for them. So 
Well, I hope that uh, I think everything that's might want to go is in the next couple of weeks. They're either going to ovulate or not. So, okay. Time will tell. Yeah. Time, time will tell. Um, so, you know, what, one thing that, that we definitely share in common is a, an affinity for scrub pythons. And oh, yeah. been, how long have you been working with scrub pythons? Um, I think I got, I'm trying to figure, I, I believe the first Nauta I got was really late 1999 or early 2000. Okay. So, so yeah. they weren't even, they weren't even not then. So. so, so you have been keeping scrub pythons probably longer than I've been alive. Uh, <laughs> well, I've, uh, I'm trying to think if I've had scrubs the whole time. I might've had periods of time where I didn't have any, but for the most part, I think I've usually had some. Okay. So, so the tannin bars were the first ones. Yeah, that was, they, they were the ones that really captured my uh, interest early on. Okay. Um, Part of that, I don't know if it was uh, because me and Yasser and Nick are all, you know, Pacific Northwest guys. Yep. And uh, so it was, you know, pretty influenced by those guys. So, and then, uh, yeah, I thought they were really, I I just, something about those big heads with the big head plates just once he grabs you and doesn't let go. So, yeah. I know, I know damn well. Uh, <laughs> were, were those the ones that you posted a, a couple of weeks ago? Um, no, the first ones I got were wild caught. Um, I think I had. Yes, those were F ones that you that you had posted. Yeah, the ones I eventually bred were uh, F ones. Um, okay. So I bred. I was fortunate enough. Um, I became pretty good friends with Dave and Tracy, and they were um, they were getting out of all their scrubs. Right about the time we were getting all, you know, me and Nick and Yasser were getting really into it. Yeah. And so uh, Tracy offered to send me the, some, you know, she sent mutton most of them, but I oh. got uh, a couple wild ones and one of her F1 babies. Okay. And, so, and then when Nick bred them, I think, cause he was, yeah, Tracy bred them first, then mutton bred them. Um, and I was able to get a mail from him. And so that was the pair that I ultimately ended up breeding. Oh, okay. Very cool. So when was that first reproduction that Tracy had done? Oh, um, Roughly. I would say it was probably 98, 99. Okay. Because it was an adult when I got it. So. Okay. So that, I mean, that must have been. Somewhere between 98 and 2001 because I bred them in 04. So. And would you say that was like early on of kind of scrub breeding in captivity in the States? No, she had bred, you know, she had bred a lot of Barnacks and Southerns. Um, people like Gary Braddock had bred quite a few Barnacks and Southerns too. Okay. Um, yeah, I think there was a pretty good, there was a fairly decent amount of people who had bred, you know, Southerns and Barnacks up to that point, I think. Okay. I mean, never like mass produced, but. Sure. It wasn't unheard of to have clutches. Okay, interesting. So, what, what was that? What was the process like when you when you bred those tannin bars? Oh man, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago. They were like the, just like the fifth or sixth species I bred, I think. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, I was. I screwed up a lot of stuff. Kept them, you know. Kept I. I got a lot of slugs. I didn't. I obviously wasn't doing it right, but. I hatched uh, the eggs I got, I hatched, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it was just your basic back then. I was more uh, feed during or feed during the summer. Don't feed during the winter. Um, and you know, it, it worked that time. So yeah, not the approach I would take now, but it uh, got it done probably because they were captive bred. They didn't know any better. <laughs> so. Fair enough. Yeah, that's an that's an interesting thing that I, I hope we kind of see now as more people are, are breeding these snakes. I mean, do you think that you know these F one and then in the future F two animals will prove to be significantly easier to to breed? Oh, yeah, without without a doubt, I think the the uh, you know like the F one halmos and stuff I think are going to prove to be completely different animals than the the uh, yeah. one you know the wild ones. And yeah. I think the first breedings were basically. Uh, I believe Oklahoma City got those as tiny, tiny, you know, tiny baby snakes and raised them up. And uh, I think the same with um, Chuck. 
Chuck's animals were really tiny when he got them yeah. too. Yeah. So I don't think that's no coincidence that, you know, they, they went really small to one place. They stayed at one place and ultimately they ended up breeding. Yeah. Did, have you had experiences with, with bigger wild caught animals that, you know, informed you of how that would go, you know, going forward with them? Um, with the halmas or scrubs in general? Scrub pythons in general of any type, really. Oh, I've, I've had, I got some big ones, but most of the time, um, I, you know, I tried to start, start with smaller ones. But, okay. Uh, you know, scrubs are funny because they usually will, you know, they're pretty amorous typically. So you, they, they let you uh, believe you're well on your way to getting something. <laughs> so you're you're easily encouraged by how willing they are to uh you know get on get along with each other but it's the getting them to ovulate and getting good eggs that seems to be the trick yeah i i feel like that has kind of been the you know i feel like every year we there's a handful of people that copulation 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 everything looks good but then there's snake sheds and it's super bright and it's late march and it's like now what's going on? Uh, what what do you what do you think some of these issues are that people are running into with with these snakes going through the motions but then not ovulating? Man, um, I think I mean there's I you know I wish I had that answer. <laughs> I would I have a popwin python that you know for four years in a row gets huge follicles, goes off food for months, and never lays eggs. Hmm. So I can't seem to get that animal to do what she needs to do. Yeah, um, you know, I with the scrubs, man. I don't know if it's uh, any different. I think the, uh, you know, maybe they're not comfortable with the nest situation. Maybe it's too hot, too cold. I mean, hard to say. Yeah. Do Do you keep nest boxes in with your snakes year round or or just seasonally? Just seasonally. Okay. Yeah, no, I only, I, I mean, I have hide boxes, but sure. I actually change it to a, you know, nest situation with bedding and stuff. Okay. Okay. What, what's your placement for those nest, nest boxes in your enclosures? I feel like that's been kind of a point of contention <clears throat> between different communities. Depends on the snake, depends on the heat. If it's uh, like a rack with belly heat, then they usually want to be on the heat. Okay. Which I would rather not, but that yeah. seems to be they won't use the box if it's not um if it's in a cage with belly heat then i'm usually pretty close to the belly heat if it's a cage with a heat light then i'm usually on the opposite side of the cage okay okay so really just kind of depending on where that that heavy concentration is and, and kind of what you want that temperature to be accordingly yeah and it'll depend on their behavior if they're if they're uh basking like too much um you know, if they sit on it the whole time it's on or sit under the light, then I'll usually bump up the the amount of wattage that the bulb is. And so they don't have to bask as long. Okay. Um, and then certain snakes, like the popwin that just laid, um, she was real heavy basking. Not as much as I thought. After she ovulated, she didn't bask at all until she stayed in her hide box on the cool end until after her prelay shed. And I think it was still a few days after her prelay shed that she started basking. But okay. once she did, she was, I mean, she was committed to it. Hmm. Um, I started off with like a 50 or 40 or 50 watt heat emitter. And she was just, you know, just practically like hanging on the cage trying to get more heat. So wow. I put it up to a 60 and then she would just sit under it. Um, and then she would, she usually buy, it would come on at eight in the morning and, Usually by like three or four in the afternoon, she was back in her hide box or nest box. Okay. So if she was going to, you know, if she would have continued basking till eight, like as long as the light is on, then I probably would have bumped the wattage up again. Okay. So are you kind of just with your, your basking spots like that, more just basing it off of behavior and less like dialing it into a particular temperature or whatnot? Yeah, uh, the ones that I have with just ceramic heat emitters, I don't use thermostats. Okay. So I just pick a bulb. I usually start with a 40 and just see how they behave. Okay. That's, I mean, I think that's a really cool perspective for people to hear because I think they're, you know, you'll see debates break out on Facebook of like, 
an 88 versus an 86 hotspot and you know people will waste an entire day debating on why a one or two degree difference makes all the <laughs> makes all the change in the world yeah i mean in a rack system i think that matters more i think mm -hmm. in rack in tubs i think um I would pay more attention to that thing, that sort of thing sure. in a bigger cage with a small, because if you look at the percentage, because I'm just using a ceramic heat emitter. So it's, you know, what, four inches, yeah, three inches. Um, so the heat's pretty generalized in a tub. You got heat across the whole back of the tub and the snakes usually choose to be in the back of the tub. Right. So, I mean, honestly, if I was designing rack systems, I would probably put the heat in the front. Because I think we're, I think we're forcing the snakes to sit at higher temperatures because of where they just choose to want to be. Interesting. Because most of the time, when you open a rack, the snake is in the back unless your hot spot is really hot. Sure. And hmm. I think that's, uh, I think that contributes to some of our issues. Interesting. I, that's not a perspective I've heard before, but it it, it makes sense the way that that you lay it out. Um, it just, yeah, that's just, it's so crazy considering just kind of like the dogma of the ball python breeder, you know, and how, you know, you say that on a different platform and, you know, your heads would probably start to, to <laughs> go, you know. Yeah, I think, I mean, I've, I, I honestly think, you know, I hear people all the time that are like, oh, snakes are smart. They know what they need. And I, I mean, I think there's one big factor that we don't really consider. And that is that mother nature never gives them everything all the time sure and we and we do that in captivity we give them you know perfect basking temperatures mother nature gives them too much basking right so i think when we're when you put a basking spot at 90 and that might be the snake's threshold it's probably going to bask longer at 90 than if you gave it a basking spot of 120 it yeah. probably sit the, it'd probably sit there for half the time and then choose to get away from it Whereas at 90, what is what we've you know figured out is probably somewhat optimal basking for some of these snakes. They probably choose to sit there too long. And then especially if you put it where they want to be, which is the back of the tub. You know, yeah. I think it's just a I've thought long and hard about moving all my ARS uh basking spots to the front and just see how they uh behave differently. Yeah, I'm act, I'm sitting next to my like my freedom breeder rack right now, and I'm just like, oh my god, my pants <laughs> are in the back. What have yeah. I done? <laughs> well, mine are listen, mine are in the back too. Yeah. I just I've been contemplating, you know, lately that it's probably just not the best place for it to be. Yeah, you know, when you watch stuff in cages with basking spots that are hotter, they behave completely different. They don't bask as much. They seem to be more focused. When you give them a hide in, an, in a cage with an open glass front, they have to choose to be warm because they have to leave cover, and most snakes don't want to leave cover. Sure. So if they're sitting in their hide box, and when they go bask, you know they really want to because yeah. they're you know literally choosing their safety, you know to to get warmer. Where in a rack system, you know most of the tubs gray, you know some have windows, some don't they're going to choose to be in the back. That's where the safest place in the tub is. And that's also where you're giving them the heat. So I think it's just uh, not the greatest combination. Yeah, no, that, that definitely makes sense. Uh, I've heard some people theorize that, um, you know, issues with clutches can potentially stem from a female, like with, let's say, like a radiant heat panel, being able to get to, to a point where there's just too much concentrated heat going into like a certain area of her body because of like a smaller surface area of the panel or whatever. Do you think, I mean, based on what you're saying, I, I feel like that would probably kind of debunk that theory of the ceramic heat emitters that are unregulated. Yeah. I mean, I would think a, a panel is a much bigger, you know, I mean, even the smallest panels got to be six times the surface area, you know, probably eight yeah. times the surface area of a 60 watt heat emitter. So I would think that the, the panel would be less or more concentrated in a wider area than what I'm dealing with. Yeah. And uh, the, I mean, I'm not a big fan of panels. I don't know if you've heard that over the, <laughs> I mean, I, I've been able to tell at least, you know, so far. <laughs>
Yeah, well, I just I, the problem with panels is if you have a, an electrical issue, like a, a probe gets messed up or whatever, you know, they can cook stuff pretty quick. Yeah. And I think it's just too much. Well, okay, if you have a heated climate controlled room with ambient temperatures, I think panels are too risky for me. Sure. Uh, and I just, you know, I don't want to have to rely on a thermostat to get things perfect. Yeah. And I just think it's too much. I think it's just too much. Most snakes aren't avid baskers. Sure. They don't, I just, they don't, I don't, especially most of these rainforest pythons. I don't, I don't believe they spend a lot of time basking. We need some panel defense on mm. here. <laughs> well, I mean, I have heat panels in most of my enclosures. So that's kind of, you know, why, I, why I'm curious. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, I feel like unless you're, securing your probe damn near to the panel itself there's going to be a margin for error that you really can't account for yeah i just I, I my ambient temperatures are you know sufficient enough to keep most of these things alive for long periods of time i don't i yeah. just giving large basking areas just freaks me out yeah. and then my room gets real hot in the summertime so it would not it would i mean one thermostat failure would just you know, completely devastate me. So I just can't afford that risk. Yeah. Do you run basking during the summer? No. Okay. I mean, if I had a gravid female, I would. Sure. Sure. But, you know, if they're like, like a, if an emerald tree bow or an Amazon tree bow is gravid yeah, because they're gravid all summer, then yeah, I'll offer them a basking spot. But again, okay. it's a, you know, a four to six inch ceramic heat emitter all the way on one end of the cage. Yeah. They can get away from it if they want to. Yeah. For sure. Do you, do you see them putting the coil where the follicles are underneath the, the heat emitter bulb? Uh, yeah, I've seen that. I've seen it with the, the boas. I've seen it with the pythons. A lot of the pythons I've noticed bask with their face. Like they'll <laughs> actually kind of put their head up around the cage a little bit. Interesting. And that's usually tells me that I need to up the wattage a little bit because they're, they're trying real hard. Yeah. So well, that's when I'll usually up the wattage. But yeah. uh, that pop one towards the end, I would say – Two weeks before she laid, um, she didn't want to come out of her hide box. She yeah. would just stick her head. So I slid her hide box more to the middle or the nest box more to the middle of the cage. And all she would do is just put her head out under the heat. Huh. And she just stayed in her box for the last two weeks. Interesting. But she would bask, just not with her whole body. Huh. I get that, that is interesting. But I mean, you know, Papua and Python's their their heads will get really dark so i feel like that could conduct heat pretty well for them yeah i've seen uh i had the northern scrub did the same thing she would just stick her head sometimes it was always towards the end usually early on you know they wanted their whole body out there but sure getting towards the end it seemed like they were trying to choose concealment plus a little heat yeah that makes sense that that is cool i'm, I'm gonna need to look for that because I, I don't think i've seen that behavior but i also can't say i've i've looked for it um, that's definitely interesting. Yeah. Well, on, on that topic, I mean, for one, congratulations on that pop one clutch. That's, that's huge. But that's, been, <laughs> that's been years in the making for you, right? Yeah. I mean, I, years and years ago, I had got a pair of babies that I raised up and I really, really liked them. But my friend Blake, he really wanted them. And I don't, I can't remember. He had something I wanted and we ended up trading. Yeah. Um, and I regretted it. They were, uh, they were really good snakes. And then, uh, few years ago i was like okay i better try this again so yeah i got uh, got a couple of them and then that the original couple i got they breed 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 and she gets huge follicles but hasn't laid and then my friend last year my friend was getting out of keeping snakes and he had the proven pair and i was like oh yeah i'll mm -hmm. figure it out <laughs> so i'll take them was this the pair that you experienced kind of the like the fighting or cannibalism attempted with or no i actually suspect okay so the original group i picked up was three animals it was supposed to be uh 1.2 and myself and mutton both probed this thing as a female we hmm. were you know we picked them up we, we were at the guy's house picking stuff up probe it like oh it's a girl it's a girl well i stuck the male in with her what i thought was a her the first time um, and they basically just stayed on opposite sides of the cage. Didn't yeah. want nothing to do with each other. The second time I put them in there, um, 
they seemed a little agitated with each other, but I don't know. I was doing something. I think I was cleaning rodents or something, and I left. And when I came back, it was just a mass of python. You know, you couldn't tell where one began and the other ended. Mm -hmm. And uh, I finally got them separated. And I was like, well, you know, you hear all this stuff with poppins. I thought, well, maybe she, they're just incompatible. This pair is just incompatible. Yeah. So um, I, I've got um, a, two more males since then. And so I put I put a male, a known male that she had never been, well, what I thought was a she, in there. And they instantly started fighting like carpet pythons, like head battling, you know, and I'm like, that thing is not a female. So I stuck or um, so I stuck that snake in with a known female, and they were in the hide box cuddling. I never saw for sure copulation. I saw what I thought was, but I, you know, I really wasn't gonna tear things apart. Sure. So that animal, you know, I mean, I probed that thing a female and not even like a tweener, like it was just a couple. I don't know if the I have I kind of wonder sometimes if they get stuck like uh stuck sheds you know because they get if it's a male they shed their hemipenes and that right. doesn't you know that people call that sperm plugs but it's actually right. just shed hemipenes but yeah if that doesn't always come out i think it builds up and can get in the way that makes sense i i i, I could <clears throat> and i've that. had i've had chondros and scrubs that i bought um that were fresh imports that i probed the, the i was sold them as females i probed them as females when i got them and then like two or three sheds later in captivity when they finally get like that real that first real good you yeah. know perfect captive shed and it's like oh it's got he shed hemipenes that's like well, yep. it's a, you know so i i have a theory that a lot of those miss sex snakes might just be from stuck sheds being in the way yeah, I guess the 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 two sexes are are uh, are female and, and unsexed, <laughs> or yeah. male and unsexed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty <laughs> much it. Yeah, I, I, uh, it I've had I've had countless instances of with scrub pythons of of missexed animals. Um, well, one thing that I've noticed over time, and I'm, I'm curious if you have, and I also want to relate this to the pop ones. I see some pretty significant sexual dimorphism in just like the morphology of the scrub pythons um like bigger heads and stuff like that yeah b bigger heads and then the mm -hmm. back third of the body I, I think uh there's a significant difference I, I, have you seen that with with scrub pythons and then also with pop one pythons that do you see any of that especially now that you've been dealing with some missex mm -hmm. animals and trying to i don't know that i've ever really like i with the scrubs i've noticed a lot of times if the snakes are equally sized that the the male will usually have a bigger, a bigger head for the size. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm trying to think. I don't know that I've noticed, you know, anything with body structure. I, I, and if I did notice anything, I would probably just chalk it up to my feeding habits are different with the men, with the girl, sure. boys and girls. So, if my girls are fatter, it's just you know I feed them more. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I probably that's probably why I don't really look at that characteristic. Fair enough. Yeah, re recently I I need to sex the snake. It's actually just to my right, but uh, it's a, a halmahera, about seven, maybe seven and a half feet now, and uh, it was sold to me as a male, and I just never double checked it, and uh, mm. I had it paired up for a while, and I, I saw nothing, and uh, I I had it off of food because as a male, I'm like I think the snake's a little chunky, uh, so breeding, I'm yeah. not beat it and i had it and i when i cleaned it i'm like what the fuck is in the middle of this snake <laughs> when i palpated the snake on the way back i'm like i need to sex this <laughs> so, well you just put a known male in there usually he'll let you know yeah i mean i that could definitely be um I, i've i've had a, a few times because of that uh mostly females with each other that one of them was, was sold as a male but actually i had male halmaharas together that was supposed to be a pair. I've never had any sort of fighting or whatnot with with scrub pythons in any capacity. Had, hmm. have, I'm trying to think if I've ever put two boys together on purpose. Um, nothing comes to mind. I know back in the day we used to play around with putting, uh, I think it was mutton put knotted together, and the big male would chase the little male around, hmm. and then it was like the little male would just kind of go sit in the corner and wait his turn and uh 
they wouldn't really fight, but they, you know, you could tell they weren't in love with being around each other. Yeah. They never really battled like uh, carpets or anything. Yeah. Interesting. The, uh, uh, back on the morphology thing, like yeah. I haven't really looked at the, the spurs on a, a scrub much, but like southern white lips, the males, the spur is really different on a mature male versus the female. Okay. And the yeah. females have big spurs, but they're kind of long and straight. They're not really, they don't have much, they have a real slight curve to them. Okay. But the but the males are like it's like a sixteen penny nail, like a big monster with a big nasty hook on the end. Yeah. So you could tell by looking at them. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. But that, but that you know, that's a pretty I don't know if a young male, you know, if it's looks quite the same. Yeah. Yeah, it just it always is it's just something I'm trying to kind of pinpoint but i feel like with pop one pythons that would be very helpful especially you know yeah well the biggest once i you know putting it with a known male that i basically was chalking it up to like well he she just didn't like the first male yeah but after trying a couple more males it was like no this is clearly none of these males they're not acting indifferent they're acting like they want to fight or sure. actively trying to fight and yeah. when i put it with the known female it was completely different it showed interest in the female and went and hid with it. And I was like, Oh, I'm pretty sure they locked up, but I, I didn't want to crack the, the tub too far to look. So sure. So what, what size group of pop ones are you working with right now? Uh, four. Well, if it's, I either have 3.3 or 4.2. Okay. <laughs> so All right. I, I'm going on. I have 4.2. Yeah. That's funny. Okay, I mean that was never that was never my intent to have that many, but sure. When I, when I had the other pair offered to me, I was like, I couldn't turn it down. And then I had another lone male available to me, and I was like, well, pop one males aren't the easiest things to get, so yeah, I figured I'd give it a whirl. Yeah, I I, I feel like that was just kind of the narrative for a while with the imports is that you know for every male there's ten females. D did you find that to be the case? I mean, if they, you know, assuming they were all sexed properly, it uh, definitely seemed to be female heavy. Okay. But, you know, I have a female that I suspect is a male. So maybe I really do wonder if a lot of the bad, bad press that pop ones have gotten as far as eating their mates and stuff. I mean, I know some of it is perfectly founded, but sure. I do wonder if some of it is, you know, you're putting, putting two boys together. Yeah, I always wondered if that was just kind of like a little marketing trick to try to, say, you know, to try to sell males for for more money. Yeah, I don't know. It uh, I can all I can say is that I've stuck when I've stuck known males with known females, I've I have not had an issue. The females okay. and both both the females this year bred with two different males, um, okay. you know, and willingly, like it wasn't. Sure. You know, she would breed one male, you pull him out the next day, put another male in there, and they're at it, no big deal. There hmm. was no I didn't notice anything where she preferred one male over the other or nothing. Okay. So at least from, from this year in a vacuum, it seems like your experience probably wasn't the typical these are like the hardest python to breed experience. No, I mean honestly, I you know, I mean I when it when it works it's you know it's it just works and there's it, it you know you go well that wasn't i didn't do anything special and it just went so i think a lot of this stuff i don't know if it's not hard or it is hard it just there's a perception of what's hard i think most of these things if you just if you stick it out put in the time and wait it out you know and you have maybe more than a pair sure you'll probably you'll probably have some success I think most of the time the people that don't have success, you know, they try for a couple of years and they move things around and they jockey things around and try different cages and try different. I think every time you do all that, you set stuff back. Yeah. Do you just try to, you know, if it doesn't work one year, maybe do minor tweaks, but are you not doing? Yeah, I usually, I don't change. I typically don't change anything temperature wise. I just change uh, when I offer food. Okay. That's, that's the difference or size of the, like the team or pythons. Um, you know, I tried to breed them three times, I think before they sure. went, I think I bred them on the fourth time I tried 
And uh, honestly, I think it comes down to I didn't feed her big enough meals. Okay. I think the the year that she finally went, um, I didn't have a lot of. Uh, I'd got I'd started getting rabbits from a lady, so the the berm and the retic were eating the rabbits. So I all the jumbo rats that I had, um, I was able to usually. I, I was only giving her like weaned or medium, small, medium rats. Cause that's what I had. Sure. Um, and then that year I had, I had gotten rabbits for the big snakes. And so she was basically the biggest snake at the time other than them. And okay. so she got the lion's share of bigger meals. And I was, you know, I, I had done my research, went back, read the old Barker stuff and talking about, you know, feed them a lot of hamsters and big meals. And so I was like, okay, I'm probably just not feeding enough. Yeah. I, uh, it's, I like that you brought that up because I think that's something that the Python world took a little bit too far of the, everyone was overfeeding snakes. And now we're overcorrecting to sparse feeding. And I, I feel like that resulted in, in some less experienced keepers just underfeeding their snakes entirely. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, the reality is I still didn't feed her much during the summer. Sure. So, you know, I was, I mean, compared to most people's feeding schedule, they would be appalled at how little I feed. Um, but if you're feeding big meals, that offsets frequency. Yeah, well, a lot of it's timing. I mean, I feed a lot till the snake becomes an adult, and then I usually slow down, try to keep them towards the smaller end of their adult spectrum. And then, uh, you know, I just play it. I just manipulate when I feed after that and I'll play around with the size of food. But yeah. otherwise it's pretty, you know, it's usually not drastic changes. Okay. So I, I guess while we're on the topic, um, you know, as much as you'd like to, what, what are your kind of, what's your strategy of raising animals? Cause what you just said about you feed a lot up until adulthood, like, what does that mean to you? Oh, to me, that means I feed it probably every two weeks, too. <laughs> you know, pretty consistent. And sometimes it might be, I mean, I breed my own rodents, so I feed, my feeding habits are directly related to, you know, the boom and bust cycle of my rodent colony. Yeah. Well, so if I'm, if I have, if I have a lot of extra food, then I'll feed stuff. I mean, I've fed stuff three, four days after I fed it. Sure. You know, I'll feed, and I might do that two or three times in a row, and then it might be a month, might be six weeks before they get fed again. Yeah, it just kind of depends. Um, you know, I mean, I always said the worst thing for a snake was a feeding schedule. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's just a, you know, feed them a lot. Uh, you can feed them. I and I feed a lot of mice until they're bigger. I don't like feeding small undeveloped rats. Sure, I don't. I think that's just a crap food. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, you know, I guess we're, we're jumping all over, but I guess that's kind of the, yeah, no worries about this, uh, this kind of format, but, uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of people breeding their own rodents. Um, when, what, when did you start doing that? What was your kind of purpose behind it? And what's the kind of size colony you're working with? No, oh, well, I started out, uh, whew. There was an old, there was a guy in Montana who was supplying the rodents locally when I got into this. Okay. And I think I'd only been doing it a couple of years. And uh, no, I don't even know if it was a couple of years. It was, I mean, it feels like a couple of weeks now, but a couple, he, he was getting out right when I started getting in. And I realized, man, my collection is big. And I didn't have many snakes, but my collection was big enough that I was like, if I've got to keep buying rodents, this is going to, be ridiculous yeah. and then i started breeding rodents for myself and then since he retired i started selling mice to the local pet stores and then there was a distributor in seattle who wanted a million mice so at one point i actually had a three thousand square foot warehouse and was doing rodents oh, wow. commercially wow. But just mice i never did rats commercially but okay believe it or not back then mice was what everybody wanted nobody wanted rats yeah but, <laughs> so it, uh, so I did that for, I don't know, 10, 10 years or so. Okay. And then it was, uh, you know, it's hard to be, I mean, I'm sure as you, you probably know, it's hard to be a, uh, a good rodent breeder and a good snake breeder. You, you get, you spread yourself pretty thin. 
Yeah, I, I know that very, very well. Um, yeah, I probably would have made more money doing rodents, but <laughs> but my yeah. my heart was with the snakes. Oh, you're, you're probably going to live an extra 15 years considering you did reptiles. <laughs> yeah, well, I still uh, I still you know sit there and suck in all those rodent that rodent dander every every Sunday. So. Yep. No, I I, I get it. Um, just want to shout out to Big Phil. Appreciate the love. But uh, so what uh, so I, what what's roughly is like the size of the the colony you you operate now for your collection? Oh, I got uh, twenty, I think twenty colonies of rats, and uh, for probably about twelve colonies of mice. Okay, so pretty pretty manageable then. Yeah, yeah, it's real. And my my friend has all his rodents over here too, so I I think he's got thirty something colonies of rats. And, okay, but. So cool. what I'm taught for me, that's what I've got. Yeah. And what for, for you, I mean, I figure now you probably couldn't see yourself going back to using frozen. No, I'm uh, I'm very set in my ways at this point. It's been 20 years of breeding my own. I tried a couple of years ago, probably about five years ago. There was a local lady that I was pretty good friends with and she started a rodent business and mm. uh, she really wanted to supply me and I was, I was ready for a break. And so I tried that and it went good for about a year. And then she got a lot of customers and I started getting, you know, low on the totem pole. And yeah. Uh, the, yeah, I had one of my worst years ever because I, I just didn't have any rodents. Damn. And so I just said, I can't, I can't be uh, reliant on other people at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I guess what, what would you say to somebody who's considered breeding their own rodents or, just has it in their mind but you know is worried for abc reason um i mean i would say it depends on your collection some stuff like if you were just a chondro breeder or whatever i probably wouldn't breed my own rodents i don't know if they readily eat frozen their whole life it's you know i having live is almost never you know advantageous i would still prefer live i think it's just better not not feeding them live but pre-killed you know, sure. non frozen yeah. food. But I think if you had a collection like that, you know, if you had a small collection, but I think you start getting 15, 20 snakes, man. I mean, I mean, I don't even know what rodent prices are. I, I would shudder to look, but that would <laughs> uh, add up pretty quick. That much. They're definitely not what they used to be. But, you know, it's tough if you don't have a place to do it. You got to have a place to do it. It's not, yeah. a, it's certainly not an easy thing to do as far as. You know, you got to deal with the smell if you live in a neighborhood and all that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. I can see why people don't. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And mm -hmm. especially rats. You know, I mean, I, in the next room over, I got a handful of colonies of mice and soft furs. Um, but I mean, you could never breed rats in your house. <laughs> that would be a miserable experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. I, the first, when I first started breeding, I had, everything down in my uh, unfinished bathroom in my basement of my house. And I just had the exhaust fan running all the time. And it was, it, you know, it still wasn't good. My wife was sure. not happy with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. I, I could imagine. Um, so I guess 45 minutes later to circle back to, to topic one, back onto the, the scrub pythons uh, no over the years, what are the, all the different types of scrub pythons you've worked with? Um, I mean, if you can get it, I've had it probably other than, uh, I haven't had a Kai specimen. You got me on that. <laughs> um, but I guess I'm trying to think I've never had an Aru. Mm -hmm. I've had a couple different Southerns. I've had the Northerns. I've had Barnex a couple times. Um, I've had Clasto a couple times. Halmos multiple times. Yeah. Okay. But, uh. Yeah, no, it's uh, and Nada, Nada was the one I had the most in the beginning, but um, I'm trying to think. I think it was. I don't think I've had a Nada since 2010. Really? Yeah, I think it's been a long. It's been a long time. Wow. Yeah, that that must have been right around the time when they were still plentiful, and then a handful of years later, fell off the face of the earth for, for yeah. a handful of years. Yeah, no, I mean they, you know, nobody cared. They were, you know, I think you could get them for 125 bucks. Yeah. You yeah. Know, you can get Clastos, all that stuff for 125 to 250. Yep. 
They were just trash snakes then. Nobody cared. <laughs> and look at them. <laughs> now. Yeah, I, I, I missed the boom by probably about, I guess I hit the boom about five years too late or so. Yeah. But I would have loved to be able to, you know. Yeah, if I knew what I knew now, you know, I would have uh, I would have stocked up. But yeah, because I mean, it's pretty prohibitive to try to build build a colony of some of this stuff now. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and what what have you, what is have you seen as like the evolution of the scrub market or interest in scrubs in captivity over over the years you've been involved with them? Um, they've. I mean, they've. Uh, this will sound funny, I guess. They've always kind of had a predominant champion at any given time. Yeah. It was uh, Yasser and Nick, you know. Uh, before that, it was VPI, Gary Braddock, some of those guys. Um, then uh, it was Blake Bauer for a long time. Then, um, oh, man, I should know the guy's name. Um, the one right before you. He got in and out a couple times. David Means. Yeah, Means. Oh, shit. I feel sorry if he's watching. I, <laughs> I, I know his name. I'm just horrible with names. Um, and then, uh, you know, you got, uh, you you seem to be the one carrying the mantle now. I've, uh, I've always been into him, and, you know, I've never really been known for him. I don't usually post a ton of stuff about him. I just kind of do my thing. Yeah. But, but I mean, I feel like for the last few years, at least, if you go on to morph market at any given point in time, you're seeing you're seeing a couple of molecular reptile scrubs up on there. Yeah, I've uh, <laughs> I've had what four clutches in the last couple of years. So. Yeah, they were all you know that Cymalia was always I love scrubs. I just uh, you know there was a time I was just making too much money breeding ball pythons, and uh, it was hard doing it for a living. It was hard to justify breeding something, you know, that you get two hundred bucks for, or sure. something you get two thousand bucks for. Yeah, and, um, you know, I know people maybe say that you know that's a sellout or whatever, but it. Uh, I certainly had to take that into account for my lifestyle. I mean, I, I don't think anyone will look through any of your pages and, and call you a sellout. So I think you're. <laughs> I think you're isolated from from that terminology. No, nah, um, dude. I, you know, I don't. I have a. I love ball pythons actually, and I've got. I get so much shit every time I post one. Yeah. So there's definitely there's a serious faction. It's. I've honestly I've considered starting a different Facebook page just for my ball pythons, <laughs> so my my regular python folks don't have to see them if they don't want to. It'd be like Brian, Brian old ball pythons. Yeah. Molecular ball pythons or something. <laughs> Just kind yeah. of go, go under a pseudonym and yeah. And then that kind of screws me too. Cause then I don't, I never post my ball pythons. And so none of the ball python people know me either. Yeah. So I'm just caught in this weird limbo of, you know, I don't, I don't know what, uh, I don't have an, I don't have an identity as far as like, which, uh, you know, like there's the carpet python people and the chondro people and the sure. you know, the scrub people, and I'm just kind of all over the place. Yeah, that's probably a good place to be though, because you know, I, I feel like if you if you're relying on not even just relying on one one means of income, but like one customer base, uh, I feel like that can get you into some trouble at times. You know. I, yeah, I, and that's I mean that's why I never I never divested myself of everything even during the height of the ball python thing for me. I was always I still always had other stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah. the you know the scrubs they just they were bigger, took up more cage space. And yeah. So it was basically like, well, I can have my chondros and smaller cages, and still keep these ball pythons or, you know. Yeah. So no, I had to do what I had to do, but got back into it. Yeah, for sure. So what 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 kind of collection are you working with now with all the different types of scrubs you have? Um, I've got uh what Halmas. Um I have the two northern babies that I produced a few years ago that I'm raising up. Okay. Um what else? I've got uh the Biox. Um Oh, okay, I didn't know you had those. That's awesome. The uh, yeah, well, I thought we talked. I told you I had the two. How long ago? It must have been a little while ago then, huh? Yeah, it was a while back. Okay, when I, I first got them, we talked. Yeah, yeah, it's coming back. That's that's good because there are not not many of those things in the states. 
No, no, there. That's a tough one to get. Um, yeah. And then uh, I've got a pair of class Delepis here on loan. Um, okay. But I don't. The females, I don't. She's fairly old, and she's starting to mm. go downhill. So I don't. I don't yeah. anticipate having those very much longer. The true Highland scrubs. Oh, and I yeah, I guess I forgot I got those too. <laughs> those, those, those insignificant ones. Those insignificant <laughs> shit painting snakes. <laughs> I don't know why I, don't, I just don't talk about those ever. <laughs> I have this weird thing where I'm, I'm like, they have such a following as far as like people think they're the greatest thing ever, and yeah. I don't want somebody to be influenced by how cool they think I am based on if I have those or not, and so I've just basically like, if you didn't like me before, I don't really want you to like me now just because I have them. Yeah. So it's Fair kind enough. of a weird thing, but yeah, they they definitely. The, the the curve of the Bolins Python has been a been a weird one to to watch happen. Yeah, no, I mean if I'd have known when I knew now I'd have bought those back for seven fifty from Bushmaster. <laughs> so been like buying Bitcoin in two thousand eight. <laughs> yep, exactly. So they're fun. I mean I do really like them actually. I probably would I probably hate to admit how much I actually like them, but well we that'll be our secret. <laughs> They're not I can just uh I can I can enjoy it by myself. I don't have to uh yeah. I don't have to have others, you know, participate in my enjoyment. <laughs> so. Amen. If more people felt that felt that way and, and practiced that, uh I think there'd be a lot more happy people keeping their reptiles. Yeah, it's kind of sad. I feel like we live in a very narcissistic uh situation where it's more about look at me, look at me than you know, actually being that into stuff. Yeah. But you know, that being said, I mean, I play the game. I feel every time I post on Facebook and then on, you know, Instagram and two Facebook pages, I'm like, man, I feel like a narcissist <laughs> this stuff. But I mean, but, the unfortunate thing is, if you're not active all the time, you just get buried under the under the good old. Yeah, algorithm. no, that's the I mean, that's the sad part is it's what this we live in this. What have you done for me lately? Society. So, yeah, it just is what it is. Yeah, I, I it definitely is. Uh, Brian Fisher asks about the uh, the Tanamera clutch, and I actually am curious about that too because they, they're the babies are very interesting looking. I, I've you know I've seen a number of them either on Morph Market or from people who bought them from you, and they're they're not normal Southerns. What's what was where did those animals originate? Um, they came from uh, Dan Maleri. Okay, um, he brought a he had a group of them. They were pretty small. Um, I think he said they were all, you know, bred or it was a wild clutch or whatever hatched at the farm. And uh, I picked up a pair of them at the, um, what was it 2017 or yeah, 2017. And uh, what's the Sacramento, California, picked them out in person and then uh, raised them up. And they, you know, they're kind of a, they're kind of between what you would quote unquote call a Highland scrub and, you know, a regular Southern, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the reality, that's, that's probably the worst term ever, the Highland term. I hate I that fucking term. Uh, but I, I hate it too. The but, reality, when you, you know, when you examine them across their range, you would probably be more, uh, more accurate to say like a Savannah phase scrub versus a rainforest scrub would probably be a more accurate term. From from my understanding, they're they're kind of coming from somewhat close to like the bases of the mountain ranges, correct? Yes, none of the scrubs other than Bolins. I think they only go up a couple thousand feet. Yeah, they don't they don't go way way up. And those all those ones with like the orange bands. Um, I mean, some of them are orange, some of them are black, but those real bold quote unquote Highland animals. I mean, they basically go from the Bird's Tail Peninsula all the way to Tamika on the other side um, yeah. with that same appearance. It's when you start going further south, getting out of the dense rainforest and more into the eucalypt scrub. Because down by Maruki, southern New Guinea is basically just northern Australia. It's, sure. Um, you know, it's just that same eucalypt scrub. It's not, a, it's not you know, it's forested, but 
not uh, that deep, deep, dark rainforest. Yeah. So I Did think you'd be more accurate to call them, you know, more of a closed canopy scrub or an open canopy scrub. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for some reason, I feel like that terminology won't catch on. <laughs> no, it, it won't. I mean, the reality is they're all southern scrubs, all the same thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Do, do you think that that uh, kind of orange phase, so to speak, exists kind of down where some of the Maruki or more typical Southern animals are? Like, do you think that there's overlap in the populations? I think that those Tanamera animals seem to be kind of that where the transition is. Okay. From what I'd seen, the few that Dan, they seem to have, they weren't, I didn't see any of them that were like the hardcore quote unquote Highland look, but they were much darker and had the faint bands more so than the, you know, your typical Maruki looking. Sure. Southern. Yeah. But the babies that I've produced, a lot of them look like they, they have more of that Highland look. Yeah. So it's been pretty interesting because their parent, the male was real, real dark black, mostly with just the faintest little orange bands. Okay. And the female was a little bit more, nor more Maruki ish looking. But yeah. Yeah. That's just, it's, it's very interesting to me because I, I feel like I've seen out of a, a few, southern type clutches i guess we'll you know we'll call them that throughout highlandish looking animals maruki ish looking animals that some of these different phenotypes just seem to be popping up in arbitrary pairings of southern type scrub pythons um you know that i guess that could also be a product of a locality cross um but i guess to, to me the the two options are that captive pairing was a locality cross or these animals just pop up in, in different populations, you know? Yeah, I mean, I know, I think some of the animals you might be referring to would be like um, uh, Brandon's Clutch. Um, One of them. I think it was, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not great at following what a lot of other people are doing, but was, I believe his male was like pretty patternless looking. Yep. And so the that patternless look does happen in the Highland stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so his animal could have been one of those animals unbeknownst to him. And then when you yeah. breed it to even a normal Maruki that, you know, those different phenotypes are all probably within their genetic code. Just what combos you put together, certain animals are going to pop out. Yeah. Yeah. Just it's, it's very interesting, especially as we kind of learn more about the true origins of these snakes, because at least the way I see it, a lot of these labels have been just slapped on for the sake of marketing. And we really don't know where a lot of these animals have truly originated from. And that I think causes. Yeah, a lot no, of I would, I'm, you know, I'm a chondro, you know, I love my chondros and I, I would be more than happy to drop most of the locality names and just go to the regional, you know, this is a Northern chondro. This is a Northwestern chondro. This is a Southern chondro. Right. You know, like a roux is a distinct thing. I'd still call those a roux. Sure. But, you know, kofiao, still a kofiao. Yeah. But, I mean, that you have a pretty significant separation there on, on those islands from, you know, denser populated parts of the region. Yeah, they have their own, you know, looks. But those scrubs are all over the map, even, I think, you know, within a given population. Yeah. And it's probably just a clinal variation from the savanna phase looking one, your typical Maruki to the quote unquote highland more dark i mean some of those highland animals are practically jet black and then some of them are you know bright orange so i don't see people calling those different things but yeah I, I feel like those the darker animals often get have that oxibil label slapped on them hmm. i usually see i thought the orange ones were the ones they well there the we darker go ones they would call tamikas and the orange ones they'd call oxibils yeah and and that's you know, I feel like I feel like if there was validity to that, we'd have the same interpretation of those. Yeah, my guess, I would I would put most of my money on most of them came from Tamika. Yeah, I agree. I would. Th I agree. Just, they just probably have more of an infrastructure for animal dealers, and the wild pictures that you find from Tamika, they all match that phenotype. They do. What is interesting though, there, there's a couple pictures on on iNaturalist of uh, from from the from the Easter, eastern side. Uh, you know, yeah. from PNG of animals that are kind of like they're on the southern side of the the mountain range, but kind of nestled at the base of the mountains. 
that that have that. Yeah, no, that look goes all the way. Yeah, all the way to the coast over there. I just uh, you'll I find see that, that look. interesting. Yeah, I think I think it's more like I said. If it's dense rainforest, it's going to be one of those darker ones. If it's more eucalypt scrub, it's going to be a brown one. Yeah, that I've I haven't heard that that spelled out like that before, but it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, and it also makes sense kind of based on how they look, you know, that that darker look probably fits in a lot better in a in a denser. Yeah, area. well, and it's, you know, when they do want to bask, you know, they're going to it's harder to bask in a closed canopy rainforest. So being yeah. dark is advantageous. Yeah, uh, that, that does make sense. Uh, on a slightly different note, what, what are your thoughts on the locality type debate within Barnex? As far as like Manaquari versus whatever uh, we, we call any of them, you know, even like the I feel like one of the ones that not quite so much over the last couple of years, but I feel like maybe four or five years ago was like the Kofi out types was one where everyone thought they had a Kofi out and certain people were like, no one has Kofi outs but me. And what is uh, a Kofi Ao? You know? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, we can I've never seen a picture of a wild Kofi out in situ. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're relying on the, uh, you know, what the importers are saying. The first Kofi Owls that they brought in as Kofi Owls had a pretty distinct look that we hadn't really seen that much before. Sure. Um, so you kind of wondered, like, well, I mean, the chondros are staying yellow for a reason. So maybe being a reduced pattern snake. And it was a different... It was definitely a different type of reduced pattern than we had seen in your typical reduced pattern barn. Irregularity. Yeah. So it was, I mean, it was, you know, it was something that I had never seen anyways. So you didn't really know, you know, I didn't have a lot of reason to say, well, I don't think that's where it's from. I don't, you know, it made sense to me like, well, whatever's driving those chondros to stay yellow forever, you yeah. know, might be influencing the scrubs to be, you know, as close to their base color as, as, uh, yeah. And actually Patrick, I, I was thinking that I, I'm, I'm fairly sure that, that Dan did. Yeah. The Dan no, I don't know. I haven't seen it. I thought I saw a video where he caught a Barnack, but I don't think it wasn't in Kofi. I didn't think. Yeah. So then at least on the, on the bird's head peninsula, all, all of those Barnacks do, I mean, what, what do you kind of attribute pattern differences too do you think they're just variable throughout that that range or yeah all the pictures i've seen they i've seen wild pictures from people where some of them were reduced pattern some of them were heavier pattern there there seems to be a slight trend in the more bold pattern sarong animals and yeah. then as you get out into the raja Ampat islands they get a little different looking yes yeah, and then by the time you get to kofio if it's true you know they're those more reduced pattern things yeah. But they're still bold pattern. It's just gone. Like the reduced pattern regular Barnex, the pattern is like reduced, you know. It's, it's like you just dialed, turn the dial off. Exactly. But with those Kofi Owl animals, like the pattern that's there is still bold. Yes. The rest of the pattern is just gone. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, it's it's been interesting for me, you know, having a handful of Barnex clutches, seeing other people get them how variable offspring are within one clutch. Um, and uh, there, there's one that I produced in 2020 that, that Patrick has a, a named the Fofiao that it was from an animal that would probably be called like a Manaquari or something like that. And like a lower grade sarong. What the female was darker than the male, their pattern wasn't crazy different, but in that clutch was you know, extreme high contrast banded animals. And then one that, if it was on an import list, would be labeled a Kofi Yeah. Um, do you think that's just, or or as or as we formally called it, the Jofi But <laughs> I didn't want to say. I mean, it. I don't. You know, I haven't. I don't. I have uh, yet to breed Barnex, so I can't okay. really say. Sure. Um, I believe back in the day, the people I knew that had bred those reduced pattern ones got only reduced pattern animals. Okay. Which, would, which would make me think maybe there's a recessive component to it hmm. or, you know, or if it's polymorphic, it's just real strong. Sure. Um, I, you know, there's most of the evidence at least, well, and not a, you know, it's been the clutches that we had proved 
um, that risk that uh, being exanthic and patternless were both recessive traits. So okay. I would assume I would assume that the patternless Southerns. I believe Yasser might have proven that that was recessive too. But okay. I I mean I would have to call him and ask him what you know because I know he produced some reduced pattern ones and I thought they were, or patternless ones and I thought they were from adults that he had produced um, that were heads. But okay. I would have to call him and ask him that was twenty years ago. Yeah. Um, that's that's interesting it's but I, I would put my money on um you know that recessive is in all of them is uh sure a re, is a um, recessive trait now if in barnex i've never seen a what i would call a patternless barnex like yeah, a me. true patternless they all yeah. seem like they either have like just a reduced pattern whether yeah. that's polymorphic or recessive you know, it could it could just be their version of patternless, and it might just be a recessive trait. And that you know, for whatever reason, these scrub looks don't seem to impair their ability to survive. So yeah. they seem to be pretty fixed in the populations. Yeah. So on, on the on the tannin bars, so the the azanthic and the patternless. For sure, you guys, you guys proved out were both recessive traits. Yeah, the clutch, the one um, Tracy's animals was she bred um, a patterned exanthic to a patternless exanthic. All of the babies, I believe, in her clutch were patterned exanthics. Um, mutton bred uh, gold patternless to a silver patterned and. The male I got was a gold patternless. Um, and when I bred that gold patternless to the exanthic patterned, I got all four flavors. Okay. In in roughly 25%. Yeah. Like it would like you would think. Okay. And that was the first time, and as far as I know, that might still be the only time that anybody's bred where they knew what parents were on both sides. Hmm. But I haven't followed it close enough. Maybe some of the maybe means to I don't know. I don't think he ever did. Chris Foley bred uh, Nada, but I think it was, I think they were both azanthic patterned. I think mm -hmm. that's how most of the babies came out. Um, I mean, they they've been bred. I think one guy, um, it was Eric Hernandez, bred them last year. Um, yeah, but they're all breeding wild ones, so you don't know what their genetic makeup is. Yeah. Yeah, and then for whatever reason, the double recessive trait seems to be the dominant, right? You know, the majority animal. So clearly, being exantic at least was a plus. Apparently, it seems to it be an evolutionary sense. plus. It makes sense to me that being being silver compared to being gold would be advantageous. Yeah, it depends on you know. I don't know what the you know the font, if there's more rocks on the island or what, but it doesn't yeah. seem to hurt them. And yeah. Clastolepis, they seem to the exanthics there seem to act like pattern or recessive. Yeah, I, I was that was kind of the next thing I wanted to touch on. Um, I, because we, we've seen lots and lots of exanthic Clastolepis. Um, and then the when when uh Marcel Hawkins produced them a few years ago, he produced exanthics from, from two normal parents, yeah, that I don't. I don't know if those animals were captive bred, but I don't that, believe they were. But I, I, don't, I don't think know they were either. The, the I mean, the only thing that would have made sense to me is if those were from it was uh, Philippe in in Canada, like if somehow those animals. Well, they could have been like I think Ralph Kern produced them a couple times back in the day, okay. but I don't remember what his pairing was. Yeah, because that 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 clutch raised the question to me of do do all of these snakes carry. The gene for for is anthony well here's the thing clastolepis and nauta and southerns you know they're all the southern clade scrubs mm. there's not you know they're not deeply divergent okay um, it's more likely the explanation is that whatever common ancestor they had those you know those recessive traits for patternless and stuff like that were already in the mix before they that went off and speciated on their own Okay. And for whatever reason in Nada, it was an advantage. You know, we don't even, I mean, we don't know. Nada would have had to get there over the ocean 
So if you're, you know, if your founder animal happened to be, you know, happened to just be the snake with the recessive traits, then all the resulting snakes down the road, it would dominate that appearance just from happenstance. So, yeah. you know, we don't know how big the seed stock was that got there. Um, yeah. It's exactly. usually probably not a lot of animals, but. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, I mean, that makes sense to me. It's in, when you, when you, you know, laid it out that way. Um, in, in Halma Harris, what, what do you associate that? Cause I feel like, I mean, damn near half of them have that silver look or they'll look silver half the time. Yeah. yeah. No, Halmas are weird. Cause they, they do like the big color change where you'll see one day the snake's gold, you know, you'll go in there at night and the snake's fucking silver. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, I mean, I think they just have a color shift ability. I've never seen a Halma that I would consider like an exanthic, like a mutation example. Yeah, I agree um, with that. But that between that silver and gold and everything in between seems to be their, you know, their base, base colors. Yeah. In, in the in the captive bred animals, I feel like generally we've seen them be much higher color than than the wild caughts. Would would you say? Um, I you know I don't know if it's I don't know if it's color or they just have had an easier life. Sure, because a lot of the a lot of the you know the halmas when you first get them you know they look like hammered shit, and <laughs> if you can if you can uh, if you can if you're fortunate enough to get them to survive and um thrive you know it takes i mean how much are funny man it's it, you know i'd say it takes them a couple years till they start looking like they didn't come from the wild yeah you know the, you, they they got to eat a lot and get get that bush meat off a bunch of times before they really start looking you know like wow okay this snake does not look like the snake that i got two years ago um yeah. they they change a lot when they you see a halma that's been in captivity a while and is thriving. It's a completely different looking snake. Yeah, it is. Than a wild one. And unfortunately, the pictures that most people see are, you know, somebody, oh, I just got an imported halma. And you're like, yeah, that looks, you know, like an imported halma. <laughs> but, you know, we'll see. Good luck to you. I mean, I, I, I would hate to talk about how many of those things I've killed. Yeah, I mean... They that those in the Biox are the two that are just for me head and shoulders that much more difficult than the rest of the scrubs. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Um uh, and so you have a couple of, of Biox. What what are what are your what's your take on those snakes? I feel like for one, most people don't even know that Biox scrubs exist. And then yeah, we can keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs> They're hard enough to get, man. We don't need other people chasing them too. Sure. I gotta deal. I gotta deal with you and those other guys all trying to get them. I'm like, fuck, man. Leave some for the rest of us. Oh yeah, but darn, they're they are to me. They're they're the most similar to Halmaharas in the way that they act. Uh, at least in I've I've worked with a small sample size, but in in probably ten animals and over time, they're just they're not they don't act like the rest of them at the scene to me. Yeah, I don't, I've had mine a couple of years now, and when I first got them, they acted like Halmas. Mm -hmm. And the longer I have them, they seem to come more. I mean, even a halma will eventually act like a regular scrub, typically. Yes. But yes. Um, the biox that I have, you know, the one of them is far more outgoing than the other. But they okay. behaviorally, they they seem a lot like halmas, okay. um, based on you know, in you know, recently imported things. But I would imagine in the long run, you know captive raised ones are probably going to act you know pretty scrub python like yeah yeah that makes sense because um, even you know even the halmas after a few years if they're doing good they'll start acting like a scrub yeah yeah i i definitely have experienced that but it it is interesting it's almost like a they they flip a switch and all of a sudden like they're they're coming out and striking and wrapping their food and they're bold now and it's like where 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 were yeah, you? No, no. Where are you? Where have you been for three years? <laughs> like, where were you when I was shooting robins in my backyard to feed you? Like, what the heck? <laughs> it's like it's uh, oh, you know, those halmas, man. Uh, they make you earn it. They sure do. That's they probably sure. that's probably the the snake guy. You know, I've had a huge fascination with them over the years, and mm -hmm. but I've like I said, sadly, I've 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 
been involved in the death of a lot of them. Yeah. I mean, I've learned a lot. I, For sure. I'm, I think I'm much better at it than I was, you know. The, so hopefully the sacrifices of those early animals wasn't in vain. Yeah. But it, uh, you know, so far I don't have anything to show for it. So, yeah. W would you say that they are generally a smaller species across the board? Or we just it don't appears to be that, although some of the early imports I saw were, you know, 10, 12 foot. Mm. I've seen some, I've seen a halma that had a head as big as your fist, eyeballs that were, you know, like a marble. Yeah, I, I had one similar size. So, I mean, they're, I believe, I think they found 14 footers, I think. Really? Um, yeah, I think they can get big. Now, it's, I mean, King Horn I can get big too, but not all King Horn I are big. Right. Well, I think, but generally based on the photos I've seen, you know, of the people who've bred them and stuff, I, I think they're fully capable of breeding at a much smaller size than than most people might even consider adult size. And I think that's part of where we went wrong early is I think some of the animals we got thinking like, oh, these are, you know, sub adults. It's like, no, they're probably 15 year old wild, you know, that's as big as a snake sure. can get. And we made the mistake of thinking like, oh, this one will go good in captivity because it's, you know, it's only six feet instead of 10 feet. And it's like, well, six feet is probably an adult too. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. It, it seems like these snakes will become, you know, reproductively mature far before they become full size, as much as you can kind of call it full size. Yeah, this seems like the bigger a python gets, the larger the range of what reproductive adult is. I mean, I've seen pictures of rock pythons that were, you know, like six, eight feet long laying eggs. Wow. And <laughs> yeah. Then you see, you know, you see 15, 16 footers laying eggs. And King Horn, I've seen pictures in Australia where they're, you know, little tiny ones laying eggs. And I caught a 14 foot gravid one oh, wow. myself in Australia. So they they can be big too. Wow. How was that? We're going to take uh, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> but I it's can't. A pretty good story. I was, uh... so did you ever see pictures of the albino King Horn? No, I actually, funny enough, was having a, a conversation earlier today where where that came up. Uh, I'm like, I, maybe, but but it doesn't. It wasn't like, oh yes, that snake. But I, I've heard okay. of it well, today. There was a, uh, um, well, he's he's since passed on, but his name was Peter Krause, pretty famous Australian python breeder, first person to breed on peli pythons. Uh, oh. Really great, really great human being. I was fortunate enough to get to go. Uh, on a herping adventure with him in Australia. And um, he lives uh, outside of Cairns and he had the albino um, King Horn on it. And um, she had passed away by the time I was there, but he mm -hmm. knew the property that she was collected on. And the homeowners of that property, um, they he had struck up a relationship with them and every year he went there when the babies were, you know, hatching to try to see if, you know, yeah. he, could, he could find another albino. Yeah. And so we were out, uh, when we were at his house, he was like, hey, you guys want to go cruise for uh, Gravid King Horni? And he was like, they hang out on this hill, they flatten down the vegetation, and they sit in the sun. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, yeah, we, we would, yes, for sure. We would, yes, we would like to do that. <laughs> so we went, and uh, the oh. first pass, we didn't see any. And then we had turned around and we were coming back and there was one uh, real dark sitting uh, sitting on a heap of grass. And Oh, my God. So I've got this funny picture of me. I look like a total dumbass, but I was sitting there like <laughs> big, big snake coiled up and I was right there. And then she took off and I grabbed her by the tail and then my buddy went and got her head. Oh, and my God. Wow. I got a few happy snaps before she uh, went went running. Yeah. My God. I. I, I I don't I can't like imagine what that would be like. <laughs> it's pretty intimidating. It's a big snake. Oh yeah, I, I, I've dealt with a fourteen foot scrub. One. Is yeah, no, that was the biggest. That was the biggest uh, scrubby I'd ever put my hands on. Yeah. I mean, was she just super filled out in like the back third of her body? No, you. I mean, you behaviorally, you knew she was gravid based. You know, she was real dark. Sure. And she was doing what he said she was going to be doing. Yeah. Um, 
So behaviorally, you knew she was gravid, but she didn't really. I mean, there's a big snake, so I don't think the. I think the bigger they are, the less gravid they look. So yeah, I think they can. I think they can hide that pretty good. Yeah, that yeah, scrubs do seem to do that fairly well compared to some other other pythons. Um, I just I would be curious, like what size clutch a snake that big could lay? Like, would that would she 14. have thirty five eggs? No, she had fourteen. Really? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It is a wild snake too, but yeah, that's just it is interesting. Um, you know, yeah, we, no, he went, he went, he went back and found her with the eggs. She had fourteen. Wow. Okay. Because there, there have been some pretty big scrub clutches from from some bigger females. It, it, it seems like for the most part they're they're fairly low fecundity compared to other large pythons, and I think probably just on the basis of them being a lot more slender, but. uh yeah, I think they probably. I, I would put money on the majority of the wild clutches are, you know, between nine and sixteen. So I don't. Yeah. I think the bigger they are, they probably just, you know, don't lay as often, and the eggs are probably bigger. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I, how big are you, you know? Do you know roughly like how big king horn eye eggs are? I have no idea. I haven't. Uh, I haven't looked at the literature to see how that compares. I doubt it's. I would venture to guess it's not drastically different from yeah, Southern. I wouldn't think so either. Yeah. I don't like know. Have you, I haven't, I've never put a, a Barnack egg on a scale. So I don't, I imagine our Barnack eggs pretty much like a Southern egg. Yeah. Indistinguishable. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I've read the Northerns and they were basically the same as a Southern egg. So yeah. I wouldn't, I would think that, I think basically, Nada lays a smaller egg, and right. Tracy A seems to lay a bigger egg. But other than yeah. that, all the mainland stuff seems to lay a roughly equivalent size egg. Yeah, I I have only ever produced within Amethystina, and uh, I haven't seen any trend of this type bigger egg, this type bigger egg. It just seems that some clutches have bigger eggs, some clutches have smaller eggs, and it, it just... But all within reason. They're all like roughly ball python size, or a little bit smaller yeah. than ball python size. Um, but like, what would you equate a, a nod egg to, roughly? Like oh, a carpet man, egg? That was a while. That was a while back. Um, <laughs> see, that was twenty years ago this year. So yeah, I think if I remember, they were more like savu size eggs. Okay. Which is little, what a little smaller than a carpet egg. Yeah, the carpet uh, eggs vary too, depending on the species, subspecies. Sure. sure. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, not a, not a, and not a hatch quick too, like sixty days versus. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. I didn't know that. Same, same incubation parameters, just less yeah. time. Yep. Oh. And so, what you just said, ninety, is that what you're getting with your with your scrubs? I feel like. Over the I think it was eight. I think it was eighty-seven, eighty-five, something like okay. that. Okay, yeah, I've I've had. I think the was early, seventy. Maybe it was seventy-five. I'd I have to it, look. I could look on my computer. Yeah, I think the earliest I've had was like probably like seventy-six, but then uh, I had one go ninety-five. Oh wow! Yeah, no, I didn't have. I've never had. I think the retic clutch went ninety exactly, or eighty-eight, eighty-nine days. So, yeah. I imagine the everything I've read says the pop ones will go forever. So, okay, it makes it'll sense. be a long. Uh, <laughs> it'll be a long three months waiting for those things, that Yeah, damn sure will. Um, one one thing that I, I is just a, a thought in my head, and maybe just based on too too few observations, but uh, I, I have an itching. I don't want to say suspicion, but I guess question of whether or not scrub pythons or even other pythons are potentially temperature sex determinant um because i've i've had i've had i've bought some clutches where babies were incubated closer to 85 and some were entirely female or one male and six females and then uh i had a clutch last year that was was 9.3 um hmm. that was like upper like closer to 88 um I don't have a whole lot of data points on it, but it's been at least enough where I question it. Do yeah, I don't know. I think uh, I'm going off the 
the four clutches that I've had recently, and um, I've been pretty even on those clutches. I think Mutton's clutches the last couple times, I think he had a male heavy clutch, and then the same pair gave him a female heavy clutch the next time. Right. Um, yeah. But it's, I mean, I've read a, a few amount of pythons over the years, and it's, I mean, I've seen it all over the place. Sure. Um, the all female clutches sometimes I would I, you know you might wonder if there's some partho stuff going on there, um, especially if the babies yeah. didn't thrive. No, but that's the thing. Like I, they they were like just perfect, you know, regular, yeah. normal, doing their thing. Yeah, I've only had I've only had partho clutch once that I know is a partho clutch. Okay. Um, and you know I was breeding morph ball pythons, so it was easy to tell that it was a partho. There you go. <laughs> So despite what people will tell you, morph breeding of ball pythons has actually made some contributions to science. But. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a total waste. No. <laughs> no, if it wasn't for that, we probably still wouldn't know anything about partho and all that. Yeah. No, I mean, for, for as much as, uh, you know, some of us like to talk shit on ball pythons, there is a we have a lot to thank ball pythons for. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, you know, I would... I've still probably had more ball clutches than any other, you know, maybe all the other species combined. Mm. And, uh, you know, I've learned a lot of stuff from breeding ball pythons. And, yeah. You know, I mean, breeding, there's overlap with most of these pythons. If you. Sure. You know, they have similar, similar, you know, if you breed 200 clutches of ball pythons, but, you know, you're a decent pipe. Py- you'll breed a lot of pythons doing what you did. With the ball yeah. python, I mean, what do you say are like two or three of the biggest points that you would you would look to of like this is just a python standard no matter what? Um, well, for me, I mean, I you know that 80, 82 degree ambient that seems. I mean, other yeah. than diamonds and bull, well, diamonds and bullens will both live in those temperatures, right? Um, but probably not whether they will thrive or not. That's another yeah. story, but. Most of the pythons, you know, if of the majority of your year was in that 80 to 82 range, I mean, most of them will be pretty happy. Yeah. yeah. So that's one thing. And then, uh, you know, feeding, feeding them. They, uh, I think ball pythons, they, they taught me a lot about food cycling. Um, okay. Because a lot of the times back then I was breeding, you know, some wild caught females. And they just didn't eat all year. Sure. Um, that's just, you know, that's not how ball pythons behaved back in the day. Yeah. They, they would pick their spots. And uh, so they really taught me, like, when they're feeding, they want to lay eggs, too. Mm. They want to build up those reserves and then lay a clutch. Um, so I learned a lot about food cycling from balls. Um, you see, when you've bred a lot of one thing, um, ball python, well, anything, carpets, balls. If you breed a lot of one thing, you're going to just see a lot of variation. Clutch size, you're going to see. I mean, I've had ball python eggs that are 140 grams, and I think I've had ball python eggs that were 40 grams. Really? So you see a yeah. huge range of, you know, what a species is capable of when you when you breed it on numbers like that. So, yeah. you know, you can learn – Breeding any python, you'll learn the majority of python breeding stuff. You know, I tell people anchorees are great because they do all the python stuff just in miniature. <laughs> yeah, so that's true. You know. And there's there's a lot of funny overlaps, like blackhead eggs and chondro eggs are very similar as far as you know they can't get wet. So. Mm. Other some other python eggs, you can hose them down with water, but that's a death sentence for those two species. Yeah, and and they're not, you know, you would think, well, one's a not a rainforest snake, and the other one's a rainforest snake. They don't, you know, what's the what's the connection? But there seems to be the 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 problems that plague black py- or black headed pythons is the same problems with chondros. Yeah, so, you know, you can you you'll start picking up certain things with different groups of pythons that overlap with other ones. Yeah. And I think that can be said on a more broad scale about reptiles in general. I I feel like a lot of advances that have been made are like 
Python breeders taking stuff from monitor breeders or, you know, I, I think that there's not enough looking around to different areas for little tactics that, that, that probably could be done. Yeah. I mean, what I was talking about earlier with higher basking temperatures and stuff, that's, that's more something that from being in places where pythons occur, I've done that a couple of times and you realize like, man, it's freaking hot. Like <laughs> it's hot. These things are not, you know, they're, I've been there when it's cold. I mean, I've froze my ass off too. And so it's like, man, these things are in a much wider, you know, range of temperatures than we think. Yeah. And so it's, uh, and then I'm not proposing that, you know, they need that. Obviously they're, you know, they're capable of handling it, but they, uh, they, most of them seem pretty happy in that tight time, you know, temp range, yeah. but they're fully capable. I think I, I like having with cages. I I'm definitely seeing a correlation with having higher basking spots, um, where they don't bask as much. They behave more like I would expect a wild snake. They go sit on it just long enough to get to whatever temperature they're trying to get to. And then they go hide. And, um, you know, I think that's more how they would behave naturally versus if you give them perfect, you know, 88, 86, they're going to sit on it all day because they're never actually getting to the temperature. You know, physiologically, they're probably designed to get hotter than they should for a short period of time. And then they yeah. retain that heat. And when you give them, you know, the perfect temperature, they, you know, they don't, they're still not getting as hot as they want to. And so I think they over bask. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, you know, for me, there's there's crossover. I, I keep a lot of montane rattlesnakes and, you know, I'll walk into the room at, at 730, no lights are on and it's it's 61 degrees and, you know, no one's out. And then at, at 11 o'clock when the basking has been on for an hour, they're all sitting under their spot lamps and I could probably gun them at 105 in places, but they're only there for, you know, two hours, maybe two and a half hours tops. And then they're cruising around and, by nighttime, they're back in their spot or, you know, hiding. Uh, I feel like, I feel like at a certain point, these snakes aren't all that different from each other. You know, they're all going through the same. Yeah, violence. no, I think they're, I think they're all doing the balancing act of, you know, I got to get hotter than I need to because it's going to get colder tonight than I want it to. So, yeah, you know, we just in captivity, we've basically in the last, you know, 50 years of keeping reptiles, we slowly whittle away you know, from what we think they need and we slow, we're constantly taking and taking and taking until we finally get down to like, well, these are the precise things that make it easy for us to keep them. Yeah. And, you know, good, bad, or otherwise, I think the jury's out. Sometimes I wonder if we're creating weaker snakes um, in a captive situation because they're not, they're never exposed, you know, to anything that's not, you know, considered relatively perfect. And so it's uh, because I I mean, I remember when my when I first had this new snake building on the end of my shop here, it got so hot. I was freaking out. I mean, I thought my whole collection is going to die. It's like 88 degrees in my room. Yeah. Like, and the snakes are like, they didn't give a shit, you know, but it's back. You know, there was only like that for a couple hours. And then at night, it's back down to 80. And they're I mean, I never even saw the chondros. You know, I kind of use them as the canary in the coal mine, and they're because they're the all the snakes across the top of my room, and yeah. they're all sitting there perfectly tightly coiled. They're not acting distressed. And then I've had a snake in a cage with a with a heat panel, all frumpy, laying with it. You know, like clear clearly it's too hot. It's not happy. Yeah. And uh, so it's they can they can handle way more than we think they can. And I mean, I'm not proposing we, you know overstress them with other things but i do sometimes wonder if we're creating a bunch of weak snakes yeah well speaking of weak snakes <laughs> back from earlier do you think that designer conjures have contributed to, to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean of course they have because it's they've contributed to just the overall mm -hmm. knowledge of the basics of keeping and breeding conjures they haven't contributed shit otherwise, but <laughs> they, uh, you know, we know, we know what to do with chondros because, you know, those guys did that. And listen, sure. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say those old timers 
did anything wrong. They they got what they could get. Like they, yeah. you know, they don't. The only thing that I fault some of them for was when the handwriting was on the wall, and they were, you know, still doubling down on it's all a green snake on a stick. That uh, yeah, you know, that never sat well with me. It's like, well, clearly a bioc and a Nauru aren't the same snake. Sure. I don't need a molecular biologist to tell me that. I can fucking look with my own two eyes and see that's not the same thing. Yeah. But, you know, apparently other people can't do that or yeah. aren't willing to do that. Yeah, I think I think that the challenge is getting people who are stuck in their ways to admit that new information might might change their their ideas of what's going on around them. Yeah, I mean, I've, I mean, I'm, I'm sure if you could went and read old forum posts and stuff that I've written in the past, there's probably a bunch of it I don't agree with now. I mean, yeah. you change, you evolve, you adapt. More That's information, science, you know. Yeah, if you, if I mean, I'm kind of of the mindset: if you never change your opinion, then you're really not learning anything because, yeah. you know, you're if you're not constantly learning and and tweaking things, then, you know, you're you're going to be left behind. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, Lisa asked this a little bit, a uh, little while ago, but uh, for wild caught animals, is there, is there a size or an age where you will no longer kind of a, a accept this animal into your collection? Um, I mean, it depends what it is. Sure. How bad, you know, how bad you need it. <laughs> so it's, uh, if it was a male, you know, you're probably more, you're less likely to care how big it is. Mm. I think most of these male pythons are probably a lot like us males. If given the chance, they're going to go for it. The females, uh, you know, okay. much like our own species, they control the, uh, <laughs> the, the yes or no portion of the uh, evening. So <laughs> the, you know, I, yeah. ideally you want them as small as you can get them, but <laughs> I've uh, I've certainly had my share of big wild caught ones, and it's gone well and it's gone badly. It's all. I mean, I you know you hear a lot of people talk about bad experiences with wild snakes, and you know you can't you definitely can have bad experiences, but you can have good experiences too. Sure. A lot of it's just your ability to keep stuff, know how to read stuff. Um, yeah. But I mean, I I've had a lot of wild chondros. I know people. That think that's horrible, and uh, the vast majority of them have done fine. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, but Nido occasionally you get one that doesn't. What was that? N Nido virus doesn't come from wild chondros, so. Oh well, I don't know if I believe that. I, I'm sure they've got it too. Yeah, true. But I feel like uh, uh, they probably all have the. I believe they all have their own Nido viruses. So. Yeah. I mean, we have we have Nido viruses every every vertebrate on Earth so far that they've looked for Nido viruses, they find it. Sure. So, sure. you know, the first reptile nidovirus was the the shingleback one because they had that the if they had wet cold years they would notice wild shinglebacks that were sick mm. and they couldn't you know they the typical trying to cure respiratory wasn't working and that was the first case I'd ever seen where anybody had put money into trying to figure out what it was. Okay. And that was the first time I'd ever heard the term nidovirus. And that was when they finally cracked the code on that was what was causing the pine cone. I can't remember what the Aussies call it, the pine cone cold or whatever, but hmm. it seemed to be correlated with the the Western ones in, you know, crappy, cold, wet. They don't like being wet. So with them, it was cold and wet and they would get sick. Yeah, that makes sense. What, so what I, my, my guess is that each chondro species has its own. Each scrub has its own. Mm. If not multiple strains, sure. And yeah. whether these, whether these ones that are virulent, it's like you know maybe a carpet strain gets in a chondro and it's bad news. Sure. Maybe maybe in a rue nido, you know, a ruse can handle it, but biox can't. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, stuff like that. There's so many things we don't know about that stuff. Yeah. But For sure. humans have it. Everything boas, all kinds of things have it. So it's yeah. nothing new. It just has a name. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, let's switch the topic up a little bit to a different species that was mentioned earlier, but uh, was it, it was last year where you, when you bred the Timor pythons, correct? I bred them two years in a row. Yeah, I bred them in 22 and 23. Okay. And uh, how, how long into your 
team or venture were you successful? Uh, they were 10 when I bred them the first time. Okay. Yeah, and I had raised them up from babies. And so okay. Were, I had tried, I think when I first tried to pair them, they were five years old. Okay. And so. And they just needed some time to, to get up to that. Yeah, like I said, I believe I just wasn't feeding them quite enough. Uh, or at least the female. I never, the male's still tiny. But the mm. female, uh, I think she just needed bigger meals. Okay. So that seemed to be the year I was able to give her all the jumbo rats I had. Then yeah. She, then she went. Okay. So really just was that uptake in, in food, you think, is just what they what they needed? I mean, you know, back in the day, they used to think they just had to be old. So, I mean, there's... Yeah. There is that is a that is a part of it, but I believe the Barkers bred three year olds, so I don't think it's a, I don't think it's just they have to be old. I think five years right. is probably plenty old, but it might be where you know if you're keeping them on the small end of what's reproductively, you know, capable, then they probably have to be bigger or older. So sure, I think it's, I think. If you grow them up huge quick, they'll probably breed three to five years old. If you want them to stay small, you know, they might have to be five to ten years old to breed. Yeah. So how big is your girl that, that gave you the clutches? Um, I believe she's seven feet long. Okay. So moderate for, for a Timor, definitely not nearly what they're yeah, no, she's I mean, she's thick. It's a bit, you know, sure. it's a it's a handful of a snake. Sure, but she's not ten uh, feet. No, she's not ten feet. She uh, she's somewhere between seven and eight feet. Okay. Yeah, the I feel like the Timors have been a been an interesting one over time because, like you were saying, for for a while the the narrative was just they need to be old and that's that. And uh, I think it was probably in like the 2016, 17 range. I think Gourmet Rodent got a clutch from like a five foot female. Yeah. Um, or even smaller, like really really tiny female. Um, yeah, I've seen uh, there was uh, some pictures that came out of Indo of some that were like I was like, damn, those are small. <laughs> like yeah. they were look, they looked like they were four or five feet max with you know sitting on a four egg clutch. Wow! And so it was like, wow, those were small snakes. But yeah. they also could have been twenty years old too. That we, we you know you have no idea. True. Yeah, you don't have any way to know. Yeah, they're just. They're interesting. They're you know I don't have any Timors now. I've I've had them in the past. They're just they're they're just such weird different pythons. You know. Yeah, they're they're probably the snake I love to hate. They <laughs> I think they have the most. I think they are literally one of the most visually striking of all pythons. Yeah. And yet they're, I I mean, ah, man, sometimes they just suck to keep. They're like the uh, they're like the ain't like the the anxious Gen Z kid of yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just look yeah. and i've seen people that worked with them and had had great ones yeah it's like i just you know i don't have the time to sit there and make them my yeah. pets i i had a couple that that i i put a little bit of time into but i would say like 70 percent of them you touch them with a hook or your finger and yeah, then the it, pee and flea <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no it's like the I, we always just call it the pee and flea yep Yep, exactly. Do, do you think that that nervous energy attributes to them being a little bit more difficult? Like they just never really settle in fully? Um, I think they have a high metabolism. Um, so I think that that compounds the, you know, the food thing. If you're not feeding them enough, I think that compounds the issues with getting a female that wants to go. And sure. then, uh, yeah, I definitely, I think, if you kind of look at the history of some of these rare pythons, teamers included, you know, you'll get, you'll see people that get them, you know, keep them till they're adults. Oh, the first time they try to breed them, they didn't breed. So they give up and they sell them. And then the next person, you know, gets them and they try to breed them and met, you know, maybe they even try two years in a row and don't get anything. And then they sell them and, you know, the, the snakes just bounce around and, Sure. I mean, honestly, all the stuff that most people consider hard to breed, um, I've just waited them out. It seems like if you just mm. just keep doing what you're doing, tweak a few little things, eventually they're going to go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of, a lot of this stuff is we just have to get the hell out of the way. 
because they want to breed like that's every you know every living thing's goal in this world is to reproduce themselves yeah so it's literally the keepers just either getting in the way move you know changing shit too much not giving them something or giving them too much of something you know if you when you really break it down it's there's there's only a few things it could be sure yeah you know and luckily you know we're very fortunate to have come after some of the people we've come after you know they figured a lot of stuff out technology's Absolutely. gotten better you know i mean i can't i'm pretty low tech compared to a lot of the people now i use a lot of timers and not a lot of thermostats on things and that is more old school but you know these thermostats we have and knowing these temperature ranges and things like that i mean that's stuff you know those guys had to figure that shit out they had to just try to keep the damn things alive you know and yeah. we we're pretty blessed that i mean even the wild ones thrive at a pace that far exceeds what those guys you know but they didn't know you know they were flying by the seat of their pants so we owe them all a debt of gratitude for for the knowledge that we got for free yeah most most definitely I think you definitely that's a point that more people should really emphasize because i think these days especially with the the movement towards bioactive keeping and large enclosures and whatnot which are innately not bad things there's a dismissal of the old school or the people our predecessors of you know how wrong their methods were and you know yada, yada and I think a lot of these newer people who are, you know, on, on TikTok talking about how they know everything with their bioactive cages. I, I think it does everyone a disservice to not uh, to not acknowledge, you know, everyone who laid the groundwork for you to have that opportunity to, to know what you do to be able to keep your animals that way. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, trust me, man, sometimes my biggest fantasy in life is to, you know, have four scrub python cages and that's it, you know, just they could be. 12 foot by five foot, you know, just moss. That that would be awesome to get to, you know, to get to observe them in that kind of a, a habitat. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I fantasize about that all the time, but it's just, you know, it's not, it's not a situation I'm currently able to be in. Yeah. And I envy those who could do that, you know, but yeah. it, uh, you know, I, I set some weird goals for myself and, you know, the, you're, I mean, you're only going to get there. You can't have four cages and try to breed all this stuff. So No, you can't. You got to, uh, no, you I make a, you know, and I make a living doing it. So I have to balance all of those things together. My desires and my, you know, sometimes I have to take a back seat to reality. Yeah, for sure. So on that note, as someone who is doing this full time, breeding animals that aren't necessarily always associated with full-time reptile breeding what 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 is your mindset as far as that type of stuff goes uh you know i feel like that most people would see that as a pretty big risk considering it's kind of uh an unbeaten path you know what are your what are your thoughts on that yeah i mean it's uh you know definitely it was not a uh, career path they taught you about in school <laughs> it's, uh, you know, but I, I mean, early on, um, I bred stuff, sold stuff. And there was, you know, there's a, there was a pivotal moment where I, I had sold some snakes. Um, and I had a year to date pay stub next to the check that I had just got for the snakes. And the, the check for the six snakes was more than my year to date pay stub in yeah. mid December of the job that I had. And it was like, man. You know, if I put all my effort into that, what could I do? And then I, you know, and I'd surrounded myself um, with people, you know, Dave and Tracy were a huge influence on me and they had done it, you know, for a living. Yeah. Um, I had always, uh, you know, early on I had admired, you know, guys like Casey Lazic. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get to know him, you know, up, I, I started to get to know him like 10 years ago. Um, okay. So I didn't have, you know, I would have, it would have been great to have had him closer, younger, but I'll take what I can get now. But, uh, so, I mean, you know, I clearly, I knew, you know, that there's people doing this. Yeah. And 
you know, I I guess maybe I just was like, well, if they can do it, I can do it. So <laughs> I figured, fair enough. Yeah, give it a whirl. Yeah, I, mean, I guess there's nothing necessarily stopping you. You know, what what would be like a piece of advice to a younger keeper who, you know, has aspirations of of making a profession out of it, but doesn't want to just stick to like the ball python, crested gecko kind of lanes. Yeah, I don't know. It's you know, I mean. I would, I, it would be remiss for me not to just talk about the basic socioeconomic situation of where we're at. Like I was, I was 20 years old when I bought my first house. Mm. Um, and that stability, um, you know, I got married real young too. So those two stable things, um, were probably yeah. as much of an influence on me being able to do this as anything. I didn't, you know, I didn't spend my twenties, you know, trying to find women and stuff like that, I was able to focus on, you know, doing this and get good at it. Yeah. Um, and I had the stability of a house to do it in. And, you know, that was to, you know, the year 2000. So, you know, my, my housing costs are basically stuck in time from back then sure. compared to things now. Yeah. So, you know, obviously it's, I would be remiss to say it would not, it obviously would be more challenging today in a lot of parts of the country. Um, sure. So, but the animals are in flux too now. I mean, it would be harder to do the ball pythons for a living than it was, you know, four years ago, three years ago. Yeah. Um, my, you know, percentage wise for me, ball pythons was usually like 70 to 50% of my income. Okay. And now it's probably going to be flipped. Now they're probably only going to be 25%, you know, because just the times are changing. You got to kind of, you know, luckily for me, my interest, the the, the hobby kind of came full circle. And so yeah. my interests caught up with what other people's interests were. And so that's been very good for me. Um, it sucks in some regards. It's harder to get, you know, it's hard to get some animals I'd like to get. Yeah. So I would say the thing is, if you want to do it, you just have to do it. You just have to get animals, get good at breeding animals. And there, and there's two businesses. This, there is two businesses in breeding snakes. There's breeding snakes and there's selling snakes. And they are not the same business. They are not even close to the same business. And it's way easier to breed snakes than it is to sell snakes. And so... You know, I would say take your time, get established selling snakes, build a customer base, you know, and in time, it's basically, it's a time game. If you build a stable life and you build a stable collection, eventually, you know, the trajectory of your expenses will hopefully get low enough that your income from breeding snakes and your people knowing who you are and stuff like that, they cross and then you can do it. Some sage wisdom for this for the youngins watching the well, pod. I mean, it, you know, I I've been doing it since what October two thousand four, hmm. so it's been a minute. Yeah, but I also was you know I was doing the rodents back then too, so I had some of that income. Sure, you know. Yeah, you that know, uh, do, you do what you got to do. That definitely helps. Definitely having something like the rodents. That'll, that'll well, give you, you got to be able to you got to be able to manage money because you can't you have an income that is well basically there is no set income so yeah. when you when times are good you can't live like times are good you have to prepare for when times aren't good yeah more so than somebody with a paycheck and that's uh you know and it's it's difficult it's difficult for people to do that yeah, it's difficult even being married to another person that you know, <laughs> they're like, oh, things are good. And you're like, well, yeah, but six months from now, they might not be. So right. be more reserved. But, you know, such is life. Yeah. Yep. It's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's great now, but I might not sell a snake for three months straight. And you know, now what are we going to do? Yeah. Last year was brutal. I probably went five months. I'll sell a snake. Wow. Yeah. Last year was pretty brutal. Yeah, that's that's a terrifying thought considering that's uh you know how you're paying them the paying your bills every month, paying your mortgage every month, you know, it's but that's that is the game, unfortunately. You know, yeah. 
money circulates seasonally animals are produced seasonally it's just yeah well my wife you know obviously i give her a lot of credit she's had a regular job the whole time mm. so you know it hasn't been solely my responsibility to pay the bills fair enough otherwise i might not have been able to yeah but there i think have years have been difficult that that ties back into the the consistency in life outside of reptiles you know that yeah. uh, i think that's an interesting thing to emphasize is you know that was that was a part of the success too was having having that that anchor yeah no i i you know if i would have been you know out going from relationship to relationship and doing all that stuff you know like a lot of 20 year olds i, I would have probably never had been able to do this yeah yeah well that's so uh ryan young's advice is get married when you're in your early 20s and you can be a successful <laughs> maker. Yeah. That's not my, my advice is pick the right person. That's my advice. There you go. If it's early, then do it early. If it's late, do it late, but pick the right person. Yep. There's probably no single thing in life that could wreck you or make you from that. Amen. That that's uh that's very true. It's very true. Well, uh we're we're just under under the two hour mark. And I mean, dude, I, I've loved this conversation so far. This the information that you know, you've, you've shared with us is, is invaluable. Um, I want to, I want to ask you about a couple projects of yours quickly before we, we wrap okay. up. Here. Um, the, uh, the first of it being, being the Aru green trees. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think I've seen better, you know, captive bred Aru green trees yes. than, you know, and not to, not to, to get here. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, I, I think, everyone there, there were a lot of theories of what was going on with captive arus and i feel like you kind of you really stood your ground on your opinion and it, and it stood the test of time where it was like it's lighting and it's nutrition it's supplementation why they're losing all the white spots and you're like no you just haven't line bred them to be high white Is yeah that I mean, I basically i i kind of took stock of when i first got into it you know the narrative was you can't make you know, striped marukis, you can't make high wider roofs. Yeah. And, you know, I just took that as gospel for years. I just, I just sure. thought, you know, this is true. And then I think what happens is you see, I mean, I've probably seen hundreds and hundreds of arus come in over the years. And you start to realize, like, you know, the vast majority of them are pretty plain, like they're not extreme. So you start like statistically those really extreme animals are like 5%, but yet they're the animal that's on every poster, you know? Yeah. And it's like, that's not a representation of what a typical Aru is. Very true. And so when you start to really look at it, I mean, I basically, I was like, well, if you look at wild jungle carpets, they're not black and yellow. Yeah. They're, you know, that, 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 that rarely occurs in the wild. I mean, you can see where you're like, ooh, maybe you can see the potential, but nothing like we've seen in captivity. And so I finally started looking around. And I was like, okay, who has actually done what with the ruse? And you start to realize, like, they've done shit. There have been, like, a few clutches. They would keep one baby. They would sell the rest. Nobody knew how any of them turned out except the one they kept. Yeah. And it would turn out average or less than the parent's. And they would be like, oh, see, you can't do it. And I'm like, that's a pretty shitty sample size. <laughs> and so um, I had had the opportunity to get, um, I'm trying to think, it was like late 2000s. Chris Rooley had had a pretty nice pair of arus in Arizona. Uh, some of the nicest ones, you know. And he had bred them a few times. His, some of the, his pictures are pretty famous in the mm -hmm. books with his high white aru on eggs. And uh, I had had the opportunity to get a pair from those animals. Okay. And I had kind of thought to myself that, you know, those, the babies from those animals are going to be special. The, the first babies might not be that special because we don't know what it takes to be high white. You know, sure. is it, it's not a single gene. It's probably multiple genes and how those genes line up from one animal to the other is going to depend on how well you get that white expression. Mm. That was my theory anyways. So I was able to acquire these animals and uh, I raised them up and I bred them and sure as shit, the, uh, the, the babies were, 
far surpassed the adults, the original animals. And it was pretty high. Um, you know, I think I probably produced 15 or I'd had some crappy hatches, but I had, I'd probably produced 15 animals from them at okay. a certain point. And it was like probably eight of them were better, like better than most aroos you saw. And then there was, I think there was only two that were probably about like the parents. The rest, okay. the rest of them were better than the parents. And some of them were pretty exceptional. And those are the animals that I'm trying to breed now. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll be real interested to see if it, if it even ratchets up another notch with one more, you know, one more round of line breeding. Um, I have since started my own bloodline with wild animals. All right. And for what, for whatever reason, I actually got pretty lucky. Um, I think those two animals genes just lined up better. And the, uh, the babies, there was much better results the first time than I was expecting. I was expecting, you know, a bunch of dogs and I was just going to have put in the work and grind and raise them up. And then, but there was, there was, there was particularly one that was like, wow, that's way better than either of the adults. That's and, awesome. You know, so maybe it was just a bigger sample size. Um, but those babies overall were a lot better in their first generation than okay. the uh, other bloodline I had. So it'll be interesting. I'm trying to breed both bloodlines this year um, to each other again. And mm. then I've been really trying to breed the two lines together. And I'll be curious to see. I imagine I'm going to get a bunch of dogs, and then I'm just going to have to power through, raise them up, and then I imagine those babies would be pretty special. Yeah. I mean, it seems like you're on the right the right trajectory. Uh, what like what's your long term goal with them? Are you trying to make them as high white as possible, or or like a white stripe? You know what what's like your dream um, Aru appearance? I mean, I would love like my bloodline has more blue than the the Ruli bloodline in my okay. experience. So ideally, for me, it would be you know above average white and a lot of blue. That's I mean, it's hard mm -hmm. to beat that. Yeah. The, uh, you know, I'm kind of torn. I'm honestly really torn between God, I would love to produce just some insane white, you know, like a, but like there's part of me that's actually I don't know if I want to. I don't okay. I don't know that I want to produce an animal that exceeds anything I've seen before. Because then I start feeling like, am I breeding a Rue Condros anymore? Mm. Or am I, you know. Because so far I've never there's there's probably five wild caught animals I can think of that far that are still above anything I've produced, and so I think if I ever started producing animals better than that, that I I don't know it might kind of hmm. ruin it for me because I I still want them to be phenotypically what they are. Sure. I'm not trying to create something that doesn't naturally occur. Yeah. So yeah. I mean I'm I'm actually real happy with where I'm at now because I can pair them up and I imagine most of their babies are going to be you know far and away better than most the arus most people have the opportunity to get but they're still not like the craziest of the crazy that I've seen. Sure. So I feel like I'm still phenotypically working with arus. Yeah. Um but I'd love to do marukis. I'd love to repeat the same thing to produce solid white marukis the stripes i know they've done it in europe the aussies have done it so it's okay it's the so same it's, yeah. yeah and then i've got a few high white uh um polker animals that i would that might, they might actually hold the key to be the coolest of the high whites because I they know. have all the they have all the blue too yeah so that it's, would be sounds like designer contrast <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, like I said, I don't want to. I don't want it to not look like it could look in the wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My yeah, dream condo would probably be like a, if I could get a Eastern PNG Southern. Those some of those snakes are just. I mean, they got the blue triangles like a fucking sarong, but a perfect white stripe. Really? And, See, I'm not. Oh, man, man. That's incredible. Oh, I, and they a lot of them look like that, so it's not like a one off. I've seen probably. 12 15 that looked like that so it wow. uh, like that would be i mean never gonna happen but that uh 
for whatever reason, by the time you get to Maruki, most of those don't have much blue. So hmm. yeah. you get over to that eastern, the eastern extreme, and they they've got those blue, a lot of blue with that perfect white stripe. That would just be phenomenal. That's interesting to me because I and correct <clears throat> correct me if I'm mistaken, but once you go down in, into Australia, I feel like you're more getting like green and yellow and blue as opposed to or and, and white as opposed to like a lot of blue hues in the Australian animals. Yeah, you don't I from the pictures I've seen, you don't see a ton of blue hues in the Aussie ones. And Marukis, you don't see some of them I've seen a few Marukis that had um like blue chins and a slight blue side. But most of the time, it's um, yellow side, more of a yellowish hue, and then yeah. whatever stripe you're lucky to get. The yeah. uh, I mean, that's one thing that a ruse, most a ruse, um, you know, have the blue sides and mm -hmm. some blue patterning. But yeah, uh, you know, it's not all of them. And a lot of the ruse, the older they get, a lot of that blue will start to turn yellow. Mm, okay, they definitely will yellow up. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I always love when I see you, you throw those, the pictures of those chondros up on, on social <laughs> media, because I, I'm a sucker for it. And my, my first job when I was 13, we got in um, a month into working there, uh, a pair of like probably two and a half, three year old Marukis that were producing a zoo. And it, I mean, it was almost like a perfect stripe and yeah. some on the side, I mean, I and they were just the most placid, perfect, calm chondros in the world. Those that 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 look is just it's so special to me. So I, I really I, I love seeing you focusing so much on that because I mean I, someone had to, and I, I love designer stuff too. But to me, to me that that southern look rivals most, if not all, the designers. I know you're probably gonna, you're going to say they're better, but. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, well, I don't, the design, I mean, listen, I, I can understand, I don't hate morphs. I don't hate, uh, you know, weird looking snakes. Obviously I, you know, yeah. I would be a hypocrite to say that. Um, I like all of that stuff, but I don't know if to me, it's like chondros, it's supposed to be green. <laughs> That's the whole point. <laughs> like it's supposed to be a green snake on a stick. Why is that not enough? Yeah. But you know, and I get what, you know, they're playing mad scientists and having a good time and they, they like all their, you know, their bloodline history, which is all, you know, those are commendable things. I'm not going to sit mm. here and say otherwise. It's just not for me. It's just not, sure. you know, I dabbled with it a couple of times and just never felt right about it. Yeah. To me, I, I really admire what you just said about the, the tracking, the, the bloodline history. That's something that I would really like to do with, with the scrub pythons going forward. I think, uh, with a lot of different species, if if the the people who were kind of founding the the lines in captivity had put that effort into tracking the animals, the you know the the progress that could be made by now would be you know exponential con compared to where where some species are at. Yeah, I think that's you know one thing that the chondro you know was good chondros and carpets. You see a lot of that, and a part of that is because you know they did a, they did a good job you know, saying, you know, go with captive bread. Yeah. You know, these, these things matter. And, uh, which I'm not saying they don't, they definitely do captive breads better. Um, but it, it, it promoted them keeping these things going over the long term where like scrub pythons, if you look back, you know, you'd have periods of time where nobody was really into scrubs. Right, and so all the captive bred animals just kind of would, you know, disappear into the ether, yeah. and you didn't really know, you know, you didn't really know who the parents were, and so, and so you basically you're re you're restarting the scrub thing from day one now in in essence for right. most of these, yeah, and that's for me with like the 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 chondro projects I'm doing I'm basically doing that I have yeah. multi generation you know, species specific chondro projects, but that's, that's a new, that's a new thing. Like no, you know, very little of that has happened in the history of keeping chondros. They were breeding, you know, whatever they could get. And that's fine. Like I said, that's justifiably. So a lot of that yeah. stuff, you know, they just, whatever chondro they could get, whatever chondro they could get. Yeah. 
No, and they weren't getting, you know, they didn't get Biox and Aru's and stuff like that, you know, back then. Most of that stuff was mainland, you know, the vast majority of that stuff was probably Uterensis for a while and then a little bit of Polker and occasionally, you know, a Stripe Southern. Yeah. But, you know, when, I imagine when they first saw the first Aru's, they were probably like, what the fuck are these things? <laughs> but, you know, if, you're, if your motto is not to you know, do wild stuff, then you weren't going to add them to your projects. Sure. Yeah. So no, that definitely and that's sense. fine, you know. Yeah. Different strokes, you know. Um, but it is it is awesome to see that, that uh, you know, the focus isn't all in, in one place. So we, we've had multiple requests for some white lip conversation. Oh, yeah. You were you were the white lip guy before being the white lip guy was cool. What's uh... uh <laughs> Well, it's you know, I that was really probably more just a chance uh because they were the thing I was trying to breed at the time and nobody was really doing it. Um you know, there's plenty listen, plenty of people bred those before me. It sure. was not I'm you know, I'm I'm far from special when it comes to doing that. It just uh in the social media age, um you know that i just happened to be the one who was still trying (laughs) so i got a lot of credit deservedly or undeservedly so you know there was a lot of you know the barkers bred a lot of northerns they never bred southerns they bred a lot of northerns okay um there's been i mean i've had my friend yasser bred northerns way you know long time ago Mm. Uh, matt turner bred a lot of southerns he, okay. he bred, I think he bred four or six clutches of Southerns. Oh wow! And he had a, he had a two point two group, and that was back in the the uh, you know the forum days. So you know those basically once it all went to social media, you know there was just nobody really doing it. So when sure. I did it, it seemed like it was some new thing. But yeah, you know it was far from a new thing. <laughs> I feel like it was definitely in a vacuum at the time, though, of, of uh, you know, interest in the snakes. But then I guess if anybody was producing them, they weren't really publicizing it. Yeah. Yeah. I was I mean, listen, when I bred Southerns, I was tickled. I was so I was so happy. Yeah. Because they had, they had, you know, she had put me through the ringer a couple of years, giving me big follicles and not ovulating. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, they taught me a lot about food cycling. To get them to go um so i was i was pretty over the moon to breed the southerns yeah and i and i've bred i've the one female i had i've bred her five times oh wow so that's what it is. you know i don't i don't know if i assume that's a record i guess if you're keeping records like that i don't know that anybody's bred five clutches out of one uh this she the the southern queen right here might be on your tail at some point uh, yeah, I mean, she's kicking ass. I tell I prefer people to her all the time. Give us your stats. Uh, what what are what's what's your uh, where are you at with the Southerns at this point as far as clutches and number of females? Um, so you got five clutches of Southerns all from the same female. Did you? Yeah, get I've got. A, I'm just raising up her. Uh, I'm raising up one of her daughters, um, and then I've got uh, a pair from Lisa. Okay. And then there was a guy in Seattle who bred him a couple times, and I was able to get a female from him. Okay. So I've got three unrelated captive bred lineages. Um, you know, and that's my, uh, that'll probably be it for a while. My pair's getting pretty damn old. So, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not expecting much. Yeah. I mean, five clutches is a uh, lot. Yeah, world. I usually my my deal is after the third clutch, I basically am like it's day to day now. Sure. And most pythons, in my experience, five clutch other than the short short fat pythons seem to be able to produce more than the long skinny ones. Mm. But the uh, you know five clutches, man. I mean that usually after that, it's it's day to day. But yeah. I think I've had. I mean, Aunt Teresa, I've had she. Had, I had a female uh, children's python lay 17 times in 20 years. So some of them are capable. Of, some of them are capable of that, but and I've heard Mac lots python. You know, I think I had seven clutches out of a Mac. Okay, she's so, she's on your tail. Oh, she she'd probably catch me. 
she's yeah. good. She's she's got them figured out. She's dialed that's, in. That's insane. Yeah, and then I, I, tip um, my, I tip my cap to Lisa. She's she uh, put in yeah. the work. Yeah, we're we're probably due to have have Lisa on the other side of this podcast at some point in time talking about the white lips. That would be pretty yes. awesome. Um, uh, so then on the, on the northern side of things, how many how many clutches of northerns have you had? Oh, uh, actually, I think I've had five or six from three females. Okay. Yeah. So similar output then from from both northerns and southerns, just now spread across a few different animals. Yeah, I've. Uh, um trying to think i think i've bred one of them three times maybe it's two of them three times and one of them two or three two times uh, yeah something like that okay a couple clutches at each one so where where do you think the stigma of, of uh of these snakes being difficult come from i'm not saying they're easy but you know by any means but you know you, you've had a lot of routine success with them and i feel like for the longest time that the, the you just heard how they're just you just they're so hard to breed they're so hard to breed i think they just turn people off honestly i think they're they're um high strung you know very they're i call them very intense yeah they just they they're you know they don't they never seem to dial it back they seem to be you know full attention all the time they don't seem to have a leisure you know situation to them and i think they just wear people out um, so I think it's more, they don't, the people who try, you know, it's the same story we said earlier, they get them, try to breed them a couple times. They don't have success. And then they, oh, they're so hard. And it's probably more that they just, you know, they didn't enjoy keeping them. So they didn't stick sure. with it long enough to, to get past that. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are you breeding yours in racks or cages? Racks. Okay. Yeah, I bred the I bred the northerns. Well, actually, I, I bred the first time I bred southern. She was in a CB seventy. Um, okay. The second time, or all the times since then, she's been in the. Uh, I don't know what tub that is. It's like the thirty three by twenty four. The yeah, the eighty forty or something. Whatever, like basically, it's like a CB seventy, but like twice the width, more or less. Yeah, yeah, it's like the there's two on a shelf instead of three. I have that just to my left here. Yeah, those are. Yeah, it's about the most versatile tub you can you can possibly get. Yeah, it's a great tub. <laughs> Man, I've read a lot of shit in those, a lot of species. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I've bred both. I had a big northern that I got from a lady that I that I bred in one of those, but all the other northerns I've bred in CB seventies. Okay, and uh, do you, do you think that the visual isolation kind of helps calm them? Yeah, I like the gray tub, you know, um, they, you know, they're not sitting there striking, but honestly, most of my, most of my white lips aren't terrible. Like they're okay. When you first open the tub, you know, they really, you know, they think you're going to feed them. And so they're sure. high strung, but once you get them in hand, typically, you know, there's like a minute or two where they're really reactive to every time you touch them in a new place or whatever but yeah I know. after a minute they seem like they're like okay i'm not getting fed something else is happening here and they and they seem to you know i don't know if they ever white lips are funny i'm not sure that they ever really really calm down um i've got a southern that my daughter plays with uh so i mean you know some of them are relatively calm but yeah yeah they seem to be they seem to be very tactile if you sure. every time you touch them in a new place they seem to have a physical reaction to that yeah yeah i definitely agree with that they're just they're they're kind of timor like in in that way of just being really like like they get over, like they get overstimulated like their their sensory load capabilities a lot lower than like a retic or a scrub or a carpet python yeah i think and i think part of that is you know like i said if your interactions with them are negative because you're whether it's you're nervous with them you're scared with them yeah um, then you just don't ever really put in the effort um, sure and i had man my first northern white lip that i bred i thought that thing was the devil itself i mean <laughs> for four years that snake huh you couldn't do anything with that snake and then it was like one day 
I open the tub and I'm like, oh, here we go. It's going to be a fight. Mm -hmm. And she was just like, man, <laughs> it was calm for the rest of the time I had her. I was like, what the hell? Like, where did you go? Did I look around? Like, did you, did, did you swap with somebody? Like it's my snake. Yeah. She was totally a different snake. And some of her babies were really mellow. Hmm. So it's, you know, but some of her babies were psychos too. So it just, yeah. And for whatever reason, captive bred white lips are way more mean than the wild ones. I've heard that. It's, it's, yeah. kind of I think it's because they're not scared of you. That makes sense. You know, I don't know what it is. They like the southern babies are even meaner than the northern babies. And everybody's like, really? oh, the southern ones are nice. Like, bullshit. Not a captive bred one. <laughs> not when it's a baby. <laughs> the meanest damn snake you'll ever own. <laughs> but most of them grow out of it with work but sure they're you know they're every bit you know they people give them more credit for being tamed than the northerns but yeah i don't know the i would say the two biggest psycho pythons that i've ever heard of or seen were both southerns really and just completely un i mean Nothing's unmanageable, but these were as close to unmanageable as you could get. Hmm. Wow. Just never, never seemed to be happy about captivity. Just Interesting. never calmed down. So. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. That's, yeah, I guess some animals are just that way. Um, so kind of a, a bit of a diversion from white lips, but a, but a species that you work with that I'm fascinated by are the uh, Sri Lankan pythons. Oh, uh, yeah, Definitely. very different than what we've been talking about. But yeah, uh, yeah, I, Kimber. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll group this in. I don't know if you work with them, but do you also work with Indian pythons? I don't. I, uh, I, I, you know, it, I'd love to get them, but the, you know, being CITES, you know, or ESA. ESA makes it a real pain in the ass. Sure does. Yeah. But uh, so, yeah, how, how do you like your Sri Lankan pythons? Um, I didn't, the, a buddy of mine, um, in Washington next door raised these guys up and okay. he didn't, and he didn't spend any, you know, no time with them at all. And so they are, uh, you know, they're, they're, since I've had them, they're definitely, I know how to work with them now. When I first got them, I was like, damn, they've got their own quirks, you know, but yeah, they, uh, they seem to have mellowed out quite a bit. Uh, I wouldn't. I mean, I wouldn't sit the male. I can, I can hold mm. and be relatively confident. You know, it's not just going to grab me, but the sure. female, I don't know that I would trust her ever, but the babies that I've, I've, you know, got to other people, I've heard some of them are real, you know, real mellow. Okay. So I think it's just a, it's just, you know, a matter of how much effort you put in. Yeah. And they're how real easy to read. Like they telegraph everything they're going to do. Sure. You know? They'll sit there, you know, if they're comfortable and crawling, they'll be comfortable and crawling. If they get tense and, you know, get the little S curve, like, oh, yeah, you are got to sit still till you start crawling again. So, yeah, they're they, really easy to read. Are they similar in their behavior to Burmese? Um, yeah, I mean, they seem to be pretty similar. I didn't I kept the pair of berms, you know, long enough to breed them. I wasn't super into them. Um, sure. So, but they seem pretty similar. They're a lot stouter. Like the berms seem to want to get a lot bigger. The, sure. the Kimbera don't seem to. They get thick and not as long. Yeah. How big are your adults? Uh, I think the females nine, nine, nine or ten feet, and the males like seven or eight feet. Okay, I, that's not giant. It's a big snake. Like it's you know yeah. she's. You know, she's not not a coffee can around, but she's she's stout snake. Sure, sure. But I mean, that's definitely a lot more reasonable for someone than a you know thirteen foot Burmese or something like that. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I you know you can you can obviously find pictures of Maloris that are huge. They can get they they're they're a big python, but they definitely. I would say overall, they seem to stay more manageable size than. The berms, but the berms might be easier. Just you know, I, overall, it seems like berms are more gentle snakes as adults, anyways. Then okay, then uh, 
the Pinboro, but my experience is pretty limited. Hmm. So, with do, either you think, do you think that would come down to just generations of captive breeding potentially? Yeah, I've heard rumor. You know, I've from talking to people, it sounds like Maloris is a little snappier than Bivitotus. You know, mm -hmm. but as just a species generality. Okay. But I've I I know people who've raised, you know, Sri Lankans and Indians, and they and they had really mellow adults. So yeah, I'm sure that helps. And I've seen berms that were psychos as adults. Sure. Too, so. Yeah. But in general, I would, in general, I would say they're they're probably just a little more high strung than a berm. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I guess it makes them just a little bit more uh, a little bit more fun to you know open that enclosure up. <laughs> you might get a little <laughs> workout. Out. Yeah, no, they're uh, they're I like them. I enjoy them. Um, I'm hoping she's gravid now. So hopefully, in the next okay. bit, we'll uh, get That's some awesome. eggs. How how many eggs did she give you the first go around? <sighs> 21 20 something like that 19 That's to 21 i think yeah they're big eggs big massive eggs mm, i bet i think they were a lot i'd have to go look but i'm pretty sure they were quite a bit bigger than the berm eggs really yeah i think they were bigger i'd have to go look smaller huh. than the tick eggs but or more like the retick eggs but not as small as the berm eggs hmm. interesting I would have uh, I would have assumed the opposite. Yeah, I mean, I just wonder, if, you know, that stocky body, you know, maybe they just have bigger eggs. Yeah, but and I would have to go look. I could be totally wrong. This okay. was a couple of years ago when I had the three of them sitting there. So. Yeah, well, I I uh, I'm very hopeful that you can make that work again because those snakes are they're incredible. Well, if I have some more, I'll send you some. <laughs> All right. Uh, any 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 bread lie over there? I don't keep bread lie anymore. I bred them three times um, in the mid two, you know, 2010, 2015, I think, somewhere in there. Okay. Okay. But I have uh, for carpets, I have inland carpets, southern coastal carpets. Um, is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Where where what's the uh, the origin of your your inlands? Where where do those come from? Uh they're the Mog line, Maug, however they yeah. say that. Okay. Yeah. Those I, I would say the inlands are probably my favorite of the the carpets. I I, I brought oh, them yeah. in twenty three, yeah. and they're just their their size, their their attitudes, their color. Just Mike, I just love those snakes. I, I yeah, I them. really I was surprised. I thought they would be one I didn't like, but I actually really like them, and that. Why well, I still have them? <laughs> yeah, because the other I, I like them a lot. I like, that's probably my favorite. Uh, my favorite carpet. What you bred them last year, or the year before? Um, yeah, I think I had them last year. Okay. Yeah, well, I think I bred them three times too. Okay. Yeah, I probably should hold back a pair if I breed them again. <laughs> <laughs> Keep them just in case. Yeah, might might maybe. How, how big of clutches were they giving you? Uh, I think it was anywhere from like nine to fifteen. I think not bad at all. Yeah. It, it, is your female on the smaller side? Is she like in the five to six range? Yeah, man. I, I bet she's not over five. Yeah, I'd be pretty surprised if she was over five. Yeah, the 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 picture on your page makes her look like she's nine feet long, but I'm looking. Oh, at this. yeah. I doubt she's that. Yeah, big. no that that lay bucket's a five gallon bucket, the bottom of a five gallon bucket. So she's not, she's not that big. Horse <laughs> perspective. Yeah, yeah, That's, yeah. Those are awesome snakes. We have another. Well, it looks uh, it looks better than the bucket. So fair enough. We have a ring pythons question mark. Is that is? Do you still have ring pythons? Yeah, I have a pair of babies that I produced. Um, I have a female that's almost an adult. Um, I lost my breeder female. She had complications after laying her third clutch. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a pretty old male, and then I have a a monster female that a friend of mine loaned me. Okay. Um, that I tried pairing up with my male this year, but she went off food for a while, but never went. Mm. And I don't know if it, you know, I had only had her a couple months, so. No hmm. big surprise there. Sure. Do you do you kind of equate them to 
to white lips in a lot of a lot of ways or are they yeah they're basically identical okay yeah it's just a white lip that lives on bismarck islands <laughs> yeah <laughs> with a little smaller head well and a lot smaller snake yeah but they're supposed to be a lot smaller anyways yeah yeah, yeah. That, i saw a monster uh, ring python one time just like jesus like how big that's probably seven feet long as big yeah. around as a pepsi can and that's i was like i was like it was so big i didn't think that's what it was <laughs> like i had to i had to look at it for like 20 minutes before i was convinced that it was a ring python yeah oh that's funny so I'm like it's impossible this is literally like you know, but I've seen a, a you know an eleven foot nada too. And yeah, I didn't believe I didn't believe that was just real till I saw it with my own two eyes either. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Lisa's asking if uh, if the rings have suffered from any inbreeding depression that you're aware of. Um, I don't think there is in. Well, okay, the they had a decent founder population, a lot more animals than people would ever think. Okay. They were they were a fairly hot smuggling commodity back in the day. I mean, you can go read you know the two books, Stolen World and uh, hmm. what's the other one? And they you know they'll yeah they'll tell you all you know there's a lot of stories about you know the rings. So they they had a decent founder population to begin with. If there's any bottleneck now, it's because there was just a mass exodus from breeding ring pythons. Hmm. Yeah. Um, because they were, for a while there, I mean, in the mid, the late 90s, probably to the early 2000s, there was quite a people breeding those. They were not, they were, I mean, should I think I bought my first pair for 400 bucks? Like, yeah, well, they were not every, you know, they were all over the place. Every show I went to, there was somebody with rings. Like, they were, they were you know, but if there's inbreeding issues now, it would just be because so many people stopped breeding them. And Tom Keoghan was kind of a unsung hero of keeping them going. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know what his founding group was like, what bloodlines they were. I don't know. Okay. But I had, uh, I had imported some from Canada that are from different bloods. So the baby, the babies for me, I think were part half Keoghan and half, unrelated so okay i wouldn't i haven't seen anything to suggest there's inbreeding issues yet yeah okay cool there's i know we're we're running we're, we're burning the midnight oil a little bit here there's just no no worries there's a couple more animals i i just need to ask about um yeah uh, but one is the uh the albino olive python project i feel like that was kind of lost in the wind for a few years but you just you just got a, a clutch of what would be head albinos correct yeah, it's head to head. So okay, you know, head theoretically, head. there's there's albinos. Um, uh, mutton bred uh, his albino male to two different um, American blood females, I guess, if you will. Okay. And uh, I got a pair from. Well, I have a pair from one litter and a lone male from another. Okay. Or a okay. clutch, not a litter. But. So you you don't have any visuals in your collection. No, I uh, on, I mean, I don't want to sound bad, but I, 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 I chose those because they were the animals I had available to me. Sure. Um, I, my goal is not to make out al- or it's not not to make albinos. It'll be it'll be fun, but I would be perfectly happy to make regular olive pythons. Sure. Sure. Fair enough. Yeah. So I, making the albinos is not you know like that's. I'm not doing it for that reason. So it was just a byproduct of olive python breeding. Just happens to be that the albino. Is yeah, just- my you know got you know one of my close friends living living near me had babies that I could get, and so it was like, well, I guess if I'm going to do it, yeah, it'd be fun to hatch out some albinos, but that would that's not the uh, that's not the mission, so to speak. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean. It, I feel like that's one of those where you can make the argument that the the wild type is you know the better looking animal, um, but uh, but yeah, I, I I do like the olives. I remember you know seeing the ones that Jeff Hartwig had at like the old Tinley Park shows and you know 2014, mm. 2015. and they they definitely were showstoppers. They they definitely were. 
Yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's kind of like the albino scrub thing. It's like, man, uh, I mean, they're pretty. You know, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say they're not interesting. Yeah. But I, at the same time, I would be a little ashamed if all of a sudden people were like, "Oh, I want to do scrubs because there's an albino." Or, I mean, to me, that's like, uh, yeah. I don't know. Well, this 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 segue was almost like we we had planned it. I uh, I wanted to ask about that that one scrub python that broke the internet last week. Um, oh yeah, the the ivory looking Wamina <laughs> that uh, yeah. definitely it was that was an interesting one because I've never seen so much attention on scrub pythons in in one day, and I have also never seen so many uh, so many opinions that were so vastly different from each other on, a, <laughs> on yeah. a time, you know what, what yeah I, don't, I mean i listen i love morph stuff too i'm i'm just as i uh, you know i got a huge track record of making more stuff yeah but some things it's i mean for me it's like man if you don't like scrub pythons for what a scrub python is and it's natural thing like man i don't know you gotta check yourself yeah you gotta get your head looked at because they're some of the most visually stunning pythons, period, just as they as Mother Nature intended them. Yep. And Mother Nature naturally gives you a lot of flavors. Like there's something for everybody. Sure is. Um, and so, but as humans, you know, obviously we're attracted to you know weirdos and wild looking shit. And so yeah. you can't help but go, ooh, that's cool. But <laughs> you know, I don't know. I it doesn't would I buy it if it was cheap? Probably, but I'd probably secretly hate myself a little bit too while I did it. <laughs> yes, yeah. you know, it's uh, sometimes the morph thing. It's, I think it can, like I have, I always think like the hypo brettles and stuff. Eventually, are there even going to be normal brettles someday, or is everybody going to steer yeah. that way, and then yeah. all the bloodlines get lost and there's just an amalgamation of you know the various morphs and if that's how it goes that's how it goes but i feel like that's kind of a a sad reality of herpeticulture and i would sure. i would hate to see you know all of a sudden some huge interest in scrub pythons because of a few anomalies sure but i guess you could also argue that that would be good if more people got into them and then actually liked them but yeah, I, I feel like it's you can't really predict how that would go, um, you know, because there's there's the there's always the like any publicity is good publicity angle. But does that really apply to animals? You know, when when we're when we're dealing with not. just Yeah, I, I think we actually kind of do have some precedents that the you know, the albino uh, white lip. You know, that thing's been around forever. Yeah. Um, I cool. mean, you know, I've I have considered getting it and i'm just like man that's i don't know that's it's a beautiful snake really beautiful snake but yeah. just wrong species sure you know like i don't there the i was at in talks with the guy who founded those because he was surprised that i was you know wasn't trying to get them yeah and i was and i was like look man i think they're amazing don't get me wrong but for the money you know i just don't i didn't see it i just yeah, it wasn't for me, and that, that you know that would be the thing with these scrubs too. They follow the same trajectory. They're beautiful. Some of these things are beautiful, but I don't. You got the reason why morph breeding works in some of these species. Is there's a big enough base of people interested in those snakes to start with. Sure, and you know if it you know the ball python thing would have never been the ball python thing if hundreds of thousands of normal ball pythons hadn't come in first you know yeah. you had you had there was a huge same with boas and retics those snakes were you know the pet snakes back in the day and the reason why the morphs took off like they did is there was a there was already a base of people yeah. doing it. and i just don't you know some of these weird python species i just don't i don't know i have a hard time picturing a long sustained and then I really don't I don't like the idea of what that would do for potential hybrids and stuff. That right. That yeah, there's there's just there's so many different angles 
to look at that situation, you know, because it could, it it could be universally positive. It could be the worst thing that ever happened, and it might would probably likely fall somewhere in between. Yeah, uh, it's like everything. Nothing is all good or all bad. There's always the in between. But yeah, but to me, it's like you yeah. know, is is something like that? Like, is that is it worth just bringing more? Is it going to bring enough eyes to the snakes where it'll be a net positive where it's, there's just more exposure now that this one thing drew a bunch of attention, but then can that attention be translated to look at how cool these barnacks are and Malukans are gold and purple and, you know, they're just like, yeah, it's good. Time will tell. I think it's like a lot of things. It's just a flash in the pan and yeah, people ooh and all over it because it's something they've never seen. And then, you know, it's old news two weeks from now. So. Yeah. And Maybe then, if they were available, it'd be something else, but I don't know. It'll be, I mean, you know better, you know, just because that thing exists, that's a long ways from having other ones like it. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that barnack that guy has, that, that thing's been around forever. Yeah. So, yeah I, mean, I don't, I don't know if it's ever laid eggs or not, but. Not that I'm I saw of. pictures of that a long time ago. That snake is not a spring chicken. No, 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 no. Neither is the Halmahera. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it got yeah. a nice, you know, nice uh, ornament, but got to do something with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I know. I think that scrub pythons are, are lucky enough to have a, like as you were saying, a, a wide enough color palette as is to, you know, you're never going to get bored of, of breeding your scrub pythons. If you do, you probably shouldn't be, be keeping Yeah, them. I would sure hope not. I mean, man, between, you know, the variability of the babies and not knowing how they're going to turn out and the color change from baby. I mean, if that, I mean, if that can't keep you interested in them, then, you know, do something else. Yeah. Yeah, that that's uh, that's true. <laughs> they got there's a lot to offer. You know, beautiful snakes. I if I wasn't, I mean, green python clay. That's my favorite. But hmm. nipping on its heels are scrubs, man. Those are man, just something about those heads. Those big, huge head plates just yeah pull at the heartstrings. <laughs> I, I I know very well. Yeah. <laughs> how that affects one when you earn you know when you do when you do it you earn it with them sure yeah you're not gonna nothing, yeah nothing nothing with them is given to you so when you have success you know you can feel feel a way about it because you know you you know what you had to do to get to that point yeah yeah for for me i really knew that like i i I, I knew that I found what I was, I really wanted to work with a number of times, but for me, it was like when I, when I would have the babies right out of the, the egg in my hand, I just didn't feel that same way with any other reptile I was breeding. Yeah. It was just, it just felt, it felt like just a, a few notches more special to me or, you know, so I'm like, why, why am I not just almost exclusively pursuing this over, you know, yeah, no, I mean, we've, you know, like I said, I've, I've, I've been around long enough to see, you know, a few people go down that road. Yeah. And, uh, in some ways I think it's, you know, it, they, it does, it can burn you out, you know, cause there are so many, it's not one, you know, it's not one thing. There's so many flavors. And I think the sure. guys that, that get into them, they get really into them. And yeah. I, you know, it can burn you out. It definitely can. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, especially for anyone who who hasn't kind of learned the behavior, you know, they can be stressful snakes if you're if you have a big adult who doesn't want you to be around them. You know, yep. that's not necessarily a fun experience. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that some of the people who were heavily into them in the past really put a lot of emphasis on just like they were co they were committed to the narrative that these snakes are heat seeking missiles and you know i'm gonna bring my riot shield into my room to clean my adult uh, screens <laughs> yeah no we didn't have a lot of that there you know there was a lot of guys that spoke highly of them i think it's 
it's more just when you get hooked on one, you kind of get hooked on them all. And so, you yeah. know, um, and for me, when I first got into them, I mean, I was blown away. I loved them all, but I, I was conscious to take stock of like, okay, I'm going to do Nauta, the smallest, mm. you know, and cut my teeth with those. Sure. And, uh, you know, and it, it uh, and I had lots of them over the years, but it was always something that I had to do other snakes, but I'm, the way I've done it now, more just kind of easing back into it and trying not to do everything at once. And, you know, just, I've, I've had a much better, well, and I just, I, you know, I've kept a lot more pythons since then too. So it's just yeah. now I'm like, okay, yeah, these things that I did back then aren't the right thing to do. And so I've, I've just, I've had a much better experience with the time under my belt than some of the earlier experiences. Sure. Yeah. That's what that's all about. Just learning from the past. We, we've had a few people uh, request to talk about these guys. So no, the done, I yeah. How are the Duns doing? How, what's, how's your done Duns project? Oh, they're, uh, they're doing all right. The, I uh, got one female that's still in play this year. Okay. Um, I had another one that was off food for a while, but, she didn't take um so okay. i think if it's gonna go she should ovulate in the next couple weeks if not it'll be on to next year but yeah they're great i like them a lot they're really cool for lysis because they the babies there's a lot of the baby colors are all over the place which yeah. as for lysis is not you know they're usually one thing or that's a sure so they're they're pretty fun for that reason yeah, I, I, uh, when I was able to work at them, I, I love them. The, the duns and the olives to me are the, those are my favorite liasses. Yeah, I like, the, I like the, the duns a lot. Cause they're not big either, like the, you know, five, six foot. Yeah. Even the max could get, I've seen nine foot mac lots, big mac lots. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's a little bigger than most savus, but not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like a perfect, Kind of like a perfect size python and then obviously just absolutely stunning i uh you know it's it's cool to see obviously you know you had the, the handful of, of breedings when they were unheard of but then imports have hit the hit the states over the last couple of years um i think yeah it's, I, no, I mean chris carmichael bred them you know 2001 i think mm -hmm. okay so, you know i wasn't i was definitely not the first but again yeah, but, kind of like, but when right. you did read them, I feel like most people didn't even know what a Dunn's Python was. Oh, yeah. I mean, still, most people still don't know what a Dunn's Python is. <laughs> like, sure. Fair enough. You know, it's still, I I have on my show banner, I have a Dunn's Python, and, and people are always like, what the hell is that? Because <laughs> it's like, they just, they don't, they're like, that. Is that a saw vu? Like, no, it's a Dunn's. Yeah. Oh, that's so, funny. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, that was a that was a good one. That I was pretty tickled to hatch those. Yeah, I could I could only imagine. Um, so I think we'll, we'll we'll end on this one, but uh, I think you've you've made mention of it on a couple of podcasts. But the uh, kind of the the scrub white whale, the the Bismarck scrub, the New Britain scrub. What's oh uh, yeah? What do you know about those guys? Oh, they're just the fuck. That's a neat ass snake, man. I've only seen a couple pictures of live ones. Yeah, and it kind of looks like if you uh, if you were like mixed a carpet python with a scrub, it's right. the, like kind of a chocolate brown, you know, not heavily patterned but boldly big like carpet python style bands. Yeah. So I mean, man, that's a sexy snake. I mean, we've we've never seen those in in captivity. Or uh, there was one. There was a Bismarck. Really? Yeah. The. Uh, um, I don't know what all I should say, uh, well, but it was. Uh, you don't say anything if you don't want to. No, no, it was. It, you know, it's no. It, it was. It was. There was one that was smuggled and intercepted. I don't know the dates. It was a long time ago. Uh, okay. I think it was at. It was at one of the zoos in New York for a long time. Mm. Um, okay. And uh, it's the it's uh, the picture of it that I've seen. It's like God. It doesn't even look like it. it. I don't know if it was really old or really shitty picture, but mm. it doesn't. I, if you showed me that picture 
and I didn't know that that was what it was, um, I probably wouldn't even be able to tell you. I'd be like, I don't even know what the hell that is. So like, it doesn't look like anything I've ever seen. Yeah. But so there was one here, but okay. and then maybe there was more back in the day. I don't know. Sure. But I know there has been one. Okay. Well, uh, I doubt that'll ever change, but that'll be pretty cool if it did. <laughs> oh man, that'd be whew, that's right up there with Crow Pan Eye or something, you know? It's like the be fun to see. Be really yeah. badass. Because there's we I mean, there's a lot we don't know. How big are they? How you know, what do the babies look like? You know, a lot yeah. of, I've looked at dead ones, but that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I've held them in my hand. They were just dead. <laughs> so, oh, man. Yeah. And they are pretty there. I can I see I saw a couple that were they hadn't been dead a long time. And so you really got a sense of what it looked like. And it was like, wow. That's very I mean, pretty similar to a Halma. But yeah, sure. You know, that'd probably be the closest, you know phenotypically looking i'd say they look more halma ish than anything yeah, but just so but, far away from where those things yeah are. but i mean but just their own thing but yeah you know, just that yeah. bold more banded pattern typical yeah oh there yeah they're... man I, that's that'd be my that'd be my biggest wet dream yeah <laughs> i take that over an own pelly any day i me me too but uh i would take you yeah. know i guess <laughs> Yeah, you could, they could keep their on pellies and give me, give me uh, Bismarck scrubby. <laughs> like that for sure. Hell yeah. Well, That's man, so crazy. I'm half tempted to just go look for the damn things just to see a live one. That would be, that'd be a dream. Yeah, I, I have no idea what it's like to get out there, but uh, wow, that would be, that would be an insane feeling to, to make that trip and to see one of those things in the wild. Yeah, I've talked to I've talked to a guy who's been out there, and it's he actually okay. said they're pretty easy to find. Really? So, yeah, they, they they I think he said they cruised up like seven of them in three nights or something. Oh wow! So the hardest part's just getting there. Yeah. Wow. But I think you have to I think you have to go through uh, either like Hong Kong or Australia to get there. From the West Coast, it wouldn't be bad to get there. Sure. So I saw. I think you could fly from like Cairns, Australia, to Port Moresby, and then okay. from Port Moresby, you could fly there. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I think I think you. I don't think there's any way to get there without going to Port Moresby, though. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's. Uh... I guess one one day, you know, that'll be that's a goal trip. Oh man, we were kicking it around for this fall, maybe. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. I hope, I hope you guys can make it. That would be incredible. No, I'm not sure. No, might just do something else, but yeah, we were definitely looking at it. I I, I understand why. I understand why. <laughs> so oh, I mean, cool. I've seen you know I've practiced shit. I've I think I've seen almost every python species in the flesh except them. I've caught, uh, I guess I I barely saw an own pelly, just the tiniest portion of it. Okay. Um, but I've seen, I've caught a baron eye. So I've seen a baron eye. Really? Uh, I've caught king horn eye. I've, yeah, I mean, I've, I think I've seen, I saw a natal lens this years ago. So I've seen, I think I've seen every python that there is except for them. Well, I, I was going to wrap up, but then you said bear and I, what was that like? Holy shit. I, I mean, most uh, people probably know what those snakes are. Oh, the Western olive python. <laughs> yeah, no, we, uh, we set out to go to the West Australia and find one and did my homework. And I found a place people, you know, said they'd seen them. And first night we went there, we uh, went swimming and then waited for the sun to go down and walk back in and sitting on the damn trail. Wow. Just like that. When it works, it works. <laughs> How big was it? Uh, probably seven, eight feet. Okay. But it was probably only about, oh, I'm trying to think what to compare it to. It wasn't as big around as a pop can. It's probably okay. a little bigger than like a, it was probably like a silver dollar or a okay. half dollar somewhere yeah. in between. Long, skinny snake. Okay. Yeah. there's. I, I'm sure I posted photos on my 
page if you go back far enough. You have to go back to 2017. But okay, he's in there. I'll, I'll definitely. Or do actually, that. shit, no, it might be 14, 2014. Okay. I mean, yeah, are there? The real giants over there, like you know, I, I feel like the the rumors is like the 15, 16 foot Western Olive. Oh, I've seen some pictures of some just monsters. Yeah. When the guy who uh, told me where to go, um, he said that he's seen one out there that literally was from one side of the dirt road to the other side. Like you couldn't have, you would have dri driven over it if you didn't stop. Holy there was nowhere. Man. So that's, it's real that the, the West. Yeah, it's real. They're big. They're big, big. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah we happen to catch a small one, but I, I, I ain't complaining. <laughs> oh, for sure. But yeah, that, that would be a bucket list. Uh, fine would be a, a real giant Western olive. Yeah. I've never even seen, I've been to where normal olives are like more times than I've never seen them. Really? Got a bear in it. So. Can't complain about that one. No. Wow. Well, we're we're just shy of the three hour mark. This is uh no, no worries. <laughs> I don't want to keep you all night. So uh but I do I really appreciate you taking the time to to be here and to talk. And this is this has been awesome. I, I really I've enjoyed every minute of this episode. Yeah, no, we definitely should talk more. I've I've been keeping an eye on you since so <laughs> you have the scrubby interests. So. Yeah, absolutely. My, I mean, it's my a partner. small, it's a small club, so <laughs> it is. Yeah, surely is, surely is. So, and for for anyone who's uh, interested in anything you got going on, or you know, to get animals from you, where can they find you online? Uh, Facebook and Instagram, and then I've got, I have a website as okay. well. So just the www molecular reptile. I'm, I imagine if you Google search molecular reptile, you know, pretty easy to find. All right. Cool. Well, uh, thank you again for doing this, man. This has been awesome. If you if you want to stick around, I'll, I'll throw you backstage and close out the All show. Right. And thank you so much. This has been this has been an awesome time. Yeah, no worries. I appreciate you. Uh, lucky number seven episode. I had a good time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. All right. Thank you. Yep. Have a good night, man. Take care. All right, everybody. That was uh, that was a hell of an episode. Three hours of uh, jam packed information. Uh, so you know, I want to thank everybody who was here live for the episode. Thank everybody who's listening after the fact on uh, streaming services or on YouTube. Uh, if you want to find me on social media, it is Instagram is right in that corner. It's at Scrub Shepherd on Instagram and just my name, Stephen Cush on Facebook. Um, for anyone who is interested in Scrub Pythons or love the Scrub Python talk tonight, uh, we started a new Facebook group for scrub pythons, just the under the name Somalia, the genus name of uh, for all these animals. So if you look that up on Facebook, you know, shoot a shoot it a request, and uh, you know, we just have a lot of people who are really passionate about these snakes these days, sharing their animals, sharing information, and uh, that's what this is all about. So thank you to everybody who listened this week, and we'll catch you again next Wednesday. Good night.